you know, what's happening today. Of course, we're going to start off with an opening statement that's going to be 15 minutes each. Once we get to the two-minute mark, you're going to hear this sound. That's the sound you'll hear. And once the time is totally up, you're going to hear this sound. That means time is up. And after the opening statement, it's going to be the rebuttal. That's going to be 10 minutes each. And after the rebuttal, it's going to be the cross-examination. That will be 10 minutes each. Now, each person has prepared several questions to ask one another. Give your opponent ample time to answer questions. However, if the person asking questions is not satisfied with the answer, give a mini reply, then move on to the next question. The person on the receiving side being asked questions, please save your questions for when it's your cross-examination time. No foul language or you will be automatically disqualified. Everybody knows we keep it clean on the beat talk for you. Uh, please refrain from excess name calling or you will also be disqualified. Let's keep it professional. I will make sure no one is talking over each other, of course. I will do my best. And please speak one person at a time so myself and the listening audience can gain full understanding. I repeat, please speak one person at a time so myself and the listening audience can gain full understanding. After that will be the intermission. That's going to be six minutes each. And uh, after that, we're going to have a second rebuttal. That's going to be seven minutes. And, of course, my favorite part of the show is the public Q&A, where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions, your comments. i down in the number 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Of course, listening audience, I'm going to ask you to respect the special guests with your questions and your comments, as well as special guests respect the listening audience. Uh, due to high volume of calls, of course, I'm going to give you guys a limited time to ask your questions and your comments. And, uh, you know, so use your time wisely. All right, and after that will be the final statement. That's going to be seven minutes each. All right, guys, let's get right into this thing. I'm going to introduce my special guest once again. Today's debate is entitled, Is the New Testament Relevant? Uh, we had a pre-debate show that's actually going to be in the description box for those that's online. Later on, you can check out the pre-debate show by clicking the link in the description box. All right, so let me introduce my special guest. My first special guest uh, He's been. Uh, this is his first time actually being here uh, debating this particular topic. You can go to his website, which is BeJewish.org, BeJewish.org. You can find him on YouTube by typing in the search box, Geo Asher 0223. That's Geo Asher 023. Let me spell it out for you guys. G-E-O-A-S-H-E-R 023. I want everybody to welcome to the show. This is Rabbi Asher Meza, what's going on, brother? How you feeling? Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me again, and I hope tonight that we can all, like I said last time, get that much more closer to God, that much more closer to the truth. And I really appreciate Brother Sadok and you, Sal. You're a great host, and uh, God willing, we'll bring the nations to God tonight. I appreciate you, my brother. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you. And uh, my next special guest, he's been on the show several times before. He's been in uh, several debates on the show. Uh, you can check out his radio show, actually, if you go to blogtalkradio.com slash Nazarene. That's blogtalkradio.com slash Nazarene. Once again, he's been on the show several times before. Um, he's uh, representing the Knesset of Jesus and the NMP. This is Sadat Ben Israel. What's going on, my brother? Welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on, Sal? Uh, shalom, Brother Neza. Shalom, all the listening audience um, that that we deal with truth tonight and uh, that we're respectful of one another and uh, that the people really, you know, get your pens, your pads, have your ears open because whether it's coming from myself or if it's coming from uh, Rabbi Neza, um, you have to work out your salvation. You have to be in the scripture. You have to burn that candlelight. You have to uh, deal with this on your own. So don't leave today uh, siding with me or with Brother Neza just because one sounds better than the other, but use what we're doing today as an opportunity to add unto what the Creator is doing in your life, leading you on to truth. And I just pray that that's the purpose that will be fulfilled tonight. That's right. Once again, I appreciate you being on the show. And everybody knows, like you said, get your pen and pads ready, take down your notes, and all the information that you hear on debate. So for you, I always recommend that you study independently and, uh, you know, ask the most high to give you the knowledge and wisdom to open your eyes to the truth. Uh, everybody knows our debate talk for you is all about originality. Of course, we have an element of entertainment, but most of all, it's about edification. So let's get this thing started. Of course, we're going to start off with Rabbi Asher, being that this is his uh, first time debating. 
you know, the all first timers uh, start first. So let me just go set this timer real quick. Hold on for a second, guys. Let me set the timer. Once again, it's a highly anticipated debate. I really appreciate I see a few more people calling in. Hey, appreciate you guys for calling into the show. And uh, let's get this thing started. All right, let me just do a radio check. Uh, Rabbi Asher, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Ahead, like brother. for the South, that my name is um, Rabbi Asher Meza. I'm based out of North Miami Beach, Florida. And today, I want to talk truth with you. And I want to help you break down any false notions you may have had of the Jewish people and the Jewish religion. I'm fully aware that there are many false notions floating around masquerading themselves as Torah Judaism, but are false. Now, perhaps false because of the indifference of some Jews, but surely false because of the ignorance of some Christians who do not, no matter how much they claim, really know what Torah teaches and or what Jews believe. So why is this show so important to me tonight? My friends, solely because it's so critical for you. Critical for you to have a standing on goodness and God. Essential for you to finally begin progressing ethically. And I think we could all agree that this is an area that many churches lack in today, that humanity is lacking in. You'd be surprised to know that one of the main reasons people actually leave Christianity is because it doesn't make sense. So our goal tonight should be to bring clarity. And you know what? The more you learn it, and the more you try to tie it into the Hebrew Scriptures, the less sense it makes, which is why you have so much in Christianity that has to be built on faith, actually blind faith. Heck, even the Trinity is known as the mystery of the Trinity. Three and one, completely separate, but in some way equal and still one. Does this really make sense to you? Believe me that I care. I have no other agenda tonight but truth. Perhaps you've never spoken to a Jew. Perhaps you see him on TV, perhaps wealthy, perhaps not, and think that they're so indifferent, they live in a different world. But my friends, I'm here to tell you that we do care. We care so much about you that we want you to join us. So we can live the dream of one God with one nation made up of all races. Why? Because not only do I love you, but the Almighty loves you. And what I'm bringing to you tonight is the undisputed words of the Almighty. Virtually the only text that, unlike the New Testament, is accepted by all the major monotheistic religions of the world today. The only text that everyone can agree that the Almighty personally gave to humanity, the Torah. This only infallible guide that chose to civilize the world through ideas and not esoteric doctrines like Christianity later did. No, friends. Torah, unlike the New Testament, when describing a good God and his plan for humanity, did not feel it had to sacrifice standards for compassion or sacrifice over obedience. The Almighty's Torah was given for all to enjoy, for all to be edified. And we see this, the way he appears in Torah, on how he really cares for us. We see that the Almighty in Torah did not only demonstrate himself as sovereign and Lord, but most importantly, someone to be emulated. In other words, we love others because he first loved us. We show mercy because he first showed mercy to us. We're kind because he was kind to us. We forgive because he forgave us. All the ideas that you may have thought were first introduced in what Christians call the New Testament. Wake up, my friends, and realize from where they were stolen from. I mean, honestly, can you really imagine even trying to emulate the Christian concept of God the Father? God, who because of his thirst for blood needed and demanded the sacrifice of his supposedly only son to soothe his thirst. A son who they also claim was himself. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. The way, the truth, the life 
all these analogies used in Tanakh for Torah and later plagiarized by the New Testament to refer to some man-god, which has always been the tactic of offshoot groups to camouflage themselves in truth just to introduce new ideas. New ideas. That's what the word Avodazara really means. Foreign worship. Anything not sanctioned or prescribed by Torah. And that's exactly what Christianity is. Quote Genesis, they'll quote the book of Psalms, Isaiah. They'll hug you and bless you with biblical words and then lead you down a path of destruction. Dancing, singing, praising the Lord, filling your life with loving compassion. All these concepts that existed prior to the New Testament and still exist today in what is known as Torah Judaism. But you know what? All this predated those 27 books known as the New Testament. And I'm here to remind you of that fact. To remind you that the major talking points of the New Testament were adopted from earlier pagan beliefs. God inseminating a virgin, becoming a man committing suicide, in other words, sacrificing himself unto himself, the supposed resurrection, and the lie about his second coming? Where is this in Torah? This is what they added. This is how they made you stray from the command of not to add or take away. And this is what Brother Sadok and I are discussing here tonight. The monumental question, is the New Testament relevant? And friends, the answer to that is no. If it is, let's have another debate. Is the Quran relevant? Or is the Book of Mormon relevant? And if you justify the New Testament, why don't you justify these also? These extra books that felt that they had to fill us in on what God was supposedly later thinking. Nonsense. We worship a God that changes not. And everything, the whole theological destiny of man, is contained in the five books of Moses, also known as the Torah. From man's first walk with the Almighty, to his great sin, to his reconnection at Mount Sinai, to his exile, and finally to his redemption found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. My friends, we have the playbook. Any addition will change the reason on why we're playing this game, which has always been to repair the world through goodness, through Torah, and not to accept the supposed vicarious atonement of some human sacrifice. And why can't we? Because it would go against the universal principle that should be at the basis of everything we consider holy. And that's that something that is divine cannot destroy itself. In other words, if there is any way that through any supposed foreshadowing, someone could take an X that's in Torah and twist it in such a way that it resembles a Y and does this over and over again, Clearly, what you end up with is not what you started off with. In other words, what you get is Christianity. And if you keep on twisting, what you get is Islam and Mormonism. And you know what you don't get? The literal message that you begin with. The pure message of peace and acceptance found in Torah, which is what I'm presenting you here tonight. So I'm here reminding you, because I love you, brothers and sisters, do not accept flimsier copies of the original, like it states in Parashat Re'eh, that tonight you're being presented with life and death, with blessing and cursing. Choose life. Choose Torah that you may live. So like Brother Ben Yisrael said, I want you to grab your Bibles tonight. And as we're quoting verses from the Old Testament, the New Testament, begin to compare, begin to analyze, and really ask yourself, is the same individual who authored and inspired the New Testament, the same one who inspired what Christians call the Old. That it is the New Testament that has to be validated by the Tanakh and not the other way around. That everything that you believe has to be justified by the five books of Moses or it's considered secondary and disposable. This is our rock. This is our foundation the unchangeable word of God, that with every generation, that with every supposed new prophet, never changes. And that's what I'm trying to solidify in your mind tonight, that all you need is the five books of Moses and the other writings that reinforce these. 
That's all you've ever needed. And I want you to listen carefully to Brother Ben Yisrael as he quotes verses from the New Testament and realize what he's really quoting. He's quoting Torah. And then ask yourself, if it's in Torah, why do I need the New Testament? Isn't that enough? Have I lost faith in God? Is God enough for me? If he was, why did I need him to have a son? And later another part of Holy Spirit. If the Torah is enough, if God's enough, we should be satisfied. But the truth is, my friends, is that for some people, it's never going to be enough. Those, those reiterations of Torah that come with a cost of allowing people to introduce new ideas, camouflaged in truth. So I look forward to an interesting intellectual debate tonight. I want you to call in with as many questions as you want. Don't hold back. And like Brother Ben Yisrael said, the Lord Almighty will be glorified tonight. Thank you. Okay, once again, you're listening to Debate Talk View Radio. The title of this debate, Is the New Testament Relevant? Is the New Testament Relevant? The number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. So far, we're starting off with a classic debate. Once once again, I really appreciate you guys for calling in. There's a lot of people listening to this debate right now. And I see people already pressing the number one, asking questions. <laughs> but uh, hold on, guys. Once we get to the public Q&A, that's the time, that's the time where you can call in with your questions, your comments, well, what I'll do for those people that are already pressed number one, I'm going to go down in order and take your questions. So if you know you're going to have a question or a comment, feel free to press the number one, and I'll get back to you later on. Right about now, we're still in the opening statement part of this debate. We're going to go to Zadok Ben Israel right now. He has 15 minutes for his opening statement. And you can go ahead, brother. All right. Well, once again, thanks, Sal. Uh, I thank everyone who has tuned in tonight on a Thursday night. And tonight is important. Why? Well, brothers and sisters, there is a lot at stake with what the brother and I are dealing with tonight. And I'm going to state this for the record so that it will be known. I personally have no issue or any kind of grudge against Brother Meza. I don't know him personally, first of all. But even secondly, just because he comes under the term um, orthodox, Jew doesn't cause me to question his belief or his dedication to righteousness and his true desire, just like I believe uh, of myself, to want to know the Most High, to know his word, do his righteousness in my life to the best of my ability, uh, pray always for his mercy and his grace and his forgiveness, and to understand not only his law, but his prophets as well. And what's being said in a nutshell is that we are out of our cotton-picking mind if you call yourself believing that Yehoshua of Nazareth, who was born sometime before the first century, could possibly be the foretold Messiah that the prophets spoke of. Now, for those of you who listened in Monday, for those of you who didn't, go and listen to the archive. Brother Meza explained that there is a messianic age that is referred to in the scripture, but no Messiah. But brothers and sisters, yet there clearly is an anointed one who is referred to, a king who shall come. And if Yeshua of Nazareth fits this bill, then, brothers and sisters, that is one of the chief reasons why the New Testament is relevant. Also, it is relevant in the sense that the message that was not only told by Yeshua, but was also spoken by the mouth of those who uh, followed him and also of other prophets in the first century. We know that the, pro the last prophet of God was not Malachi, okay? How do we know this? Well, for those of you who read Apocrypha, we know that when the Maccabean family won the Temple Mount back from the Grecians and they put down an apostasy in, the, in, uh, in Jerusalem and they rededicated the Temple where uh, the beginnings of the feast that most people call Hanukkah comes from, there were some things that they didn't know what to do with 
at the time. And the scripture says that they put these things aside until a prophet of God would come. And when that prophet would show up, he would let the nation what to do with those particular things. So we know that Malachi and those who are called the minor prophets, they all wrote their writings way before the Babylonian captivity and some during. And brothers and sisters, we know that the Maccabean revolt and everything happened uh, at least a century or so after Jerusalem had been rebuilt after the Babylonian captivity. So we know that prophets did not stop. That's one. Yeshua was a great prophet. John the Immerser was a great prophet. The New Testament tells of other prophets from that time. Now, what I want to do is I just want to put some scripture on the table. I don't want to over-talk the situation. I want to put some scripture on the table. And one thing about it is this. As we go to, uh, where do I want to start here? Actually, I believe I want to start, and um, actually, yeah, let's go ahead and let's start in Isaiah 42. Now, as you go there, I want you to be mindful of something. The brother says, if it's uh, written in Torah, then why do we need anything else? And he will concentrate on Genesis to Deuteronomy, and then what he will do when it comes to certain things that the prophets spoke, he will use the word esoteric. He will say that Christians um, built their doctrine off the of esoteric statements of the prophets. What he's talking about, brothers and sisters, is prophecies. Now, once the prophecies are given, they're no longer esoteric. I just want you all to know what the word esoteric means. So as you hear this word continually, I will use it as well. And I just want you all to understand that if it's the English word he's using, then we should all understand what this English word means. The word esoteric, brothers and sisters, actually means uh, intended for or understood by only a small group, not publicly disclosed, private, confidential. So even though the prophets were told things and they wrote these things down, not only for themselves but generations after would read these things. For instance, we know that in the book of Daniel, he was praying to the Lord, and he had been searching through some things that the prophet Jeremiah had said, okay? So, brothers and sisters, we know that not only did the prophets, but others read the things that were written in the scrolls that belonged to the prophets of Yah. Now, brothers and sisters, if these things were written and, and, and put in scrolls that others were able to read them, then they weren't secret. They weren't just for a small group to understand and no one else. Why? Well, brothers and sisters, we have a Bible today. I got a King James here. I got a Tanakh here. I have a, a Hebrew, I mean an interlinear Hebrew, Greek, English, and I also have a Septuagint. Why are all the books of the prophets outside of what Moses wrote even written? Why are the Chronicles and the Kings written? so that we all could know what went on, so that we could understand the history, the timelines, and understand the, the things that Yahweh has spoken, not only for that time, but even for the future. So the things that the prophets spoke are not esoteric. They are not meant for a small group to understand in the context that no one would understand it. Now, there will be a small group that understand it when you look at the world as a whole, but yet they weren't written so no one would understand. And what he refers to as Christianity is nothing that applies to me, and it doesn't apply to some of the listeners listening today because we are not under the authority of the Catholic Church. We, are not, we do not live our life by the creeds of the Nicene Council, this, that, and the third. Now, Isaiah 42 and 21 says this. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Brothers and sisters, how will Yahweh do this? He has already given his law, and the law itself should already be honorable. It was written, so it should already be done. But brothers and sisters, remember that the nation of Israel actually, through their sin, would cause people to look at the law dishonorably. Remember when David committed his evil? Remember what Nathan said? Nathan told David, you have given the enemies of Yahweh an opportunity to blaspheme. So brothers and sisters, man, through his action, make the laws of Yahweh seem dishonorable or minimized. 
But Yahweh will do things to magnify his law and make it honorable. And he will do it by man, by his people. Brothers and sisters, when the Lord wanted to destroy people, what did he, when he told Israel in the uh, Torah that he would destroy them and he would punish them for their sin, he did it, but he used man. He used armies. So when the Assyrian came, when the Babylonian came, in the days of the judges, when they were, uh, 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 had the Philistines and others, the thorns in their side, that was Yahweh doing it, but he did it in the person of men. So it is the same thing with the magnifying and the honorability of his law. We all, if we do right, Brother Mezza, if he does right, we, by doing the commandments, it will be magnified. It will be made honorable in the eyes of some. But there are some who are so wicked, there's nothing that can be done to help them. So let us go to something here. I want to go to Acts chapter 8 because it was something that Brother Neza said, and he quoted New Testament scriptures. So what's interesting is I'm, pretty, I'm convinced that the brother is kind of well-read, not that he understands it all, but he has read the New Testament or portions of it to some degree. So I'm going to go here, Acts chapter 8, and when I get there, I'm going to start reading at verse 32. Acts chapter 8 and verse 32, and it reads, The place of the scripture which he read was, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speak the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? So you have this Jew who is a eunuch for one of the queens in Ethiopia at this time. And why is he in the land? Because, brothers and sisters, the queen was there in the land. Now, he's actually asking one of the followers of, of Yeshua, he didn't know who this man was, but he's asking him because the man seen he was reading the scroll and said, hey, man, what you reading? And he said, I'm reading this, but how can I understand unless the man tell me what's going on? So, Brother Nezza will probably say that in the place where this was, in the scroll of Isaiah, this was either talking about Isaiah himself or possibly the nation or some other prophet. Anyone except Yeshua of Nazareth, a known prophet, many people, if you do historical research, there are many books written. Many people took him as a great prophet. They took John the Baptist as a great prophet, and others took him as a sorcerer. Uh, for those of you uh, who were listening uh, about a week or so ago, Brother Josh did a debate on here with a gentleman about did Jesus of Nazareth exist, and he even lets you know that in the, Bab- in, in the, uh, in the Jewish Talmud that they write of Yeshua of Nazareth and said he was put to death, that he did a lot of sorcery. So they didn't write on him as believers or followers. They basically said he was a sorcerer, okay? But yet he lived. So some said he was a sorcerer. Many said he was a prophet. One of the men here is being told by one of his followers that this is speaking of Yeshua, not Isaiah. And it says, verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So I'm going to go there. I'm going to follow Philip tonight. We're going to deal with Torah and Tanakh, and I'll use the New Testament when I need to. But if we can establish in the old, brothers and sisters, what is going on, then the possibility even of Yeshua wouldn't come to his mind, but yet he will put all this on Isaiah, but there will be no proof that Isaiah suffered any of what is being spoken here. So let me read this. Isaiah chapter 53, and I'm going to read this out of the Tanakh, okay? Isaiah 53, and I'm going to read this spot, this spot, the same place where he read. It says, um, okay, verse 7. This is out of the Tanakh. I got the Stones edition, uh, 53, verse 7. He was persecuted and afflicted, but he did not open his mouth like a sheep being like a sheep being led to the slaughter. Where am I? Oh, or a you that is silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Now that he has been released from captivity and judgment, who could have imagined such a generation? For he had been removed from the land of the living. 
and affliction upon them. That was my people's sin. He submitted himself to his grave like wicked men. And hold on, hold on for a second. And pay, and, and pay attention to me. Wait, hold on. I'm sorry. Hold on. I lost my place. Okay. And like the wealthy and submitted to his executions for committing no crime and with no deceit in his mouth. I'm going to say Yahweh desired to oppress him and he afflicted him. If his soul would have acknowledged guilt, he would see his offspring and live long days and desire of Yahweh would succeed in his hand. He would see his purpose and be satisfied with his soul's distress. So, brothers and sisters, here we actually see that there is one being spoken of here, brothers and sisters, who would be afflicted for the iniquity of the people. The scripture says that he would make his soul an offering for sin or he would give his life for the sin of the people. Now, Isaiah did not give his life where he actually went to death because of the sin of the people. But brothers and sisters, all prophets, if you will, they put their lives on the line to give the message of the creator. But this one here is written to die and give his soul as an offering for the sins of the people. And he would make his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death. But yet, he shall see his seed and prolong his days. This is speaking of the resurrection. So this is one of the things that he and I wouldn't agree on. And there are many other things like this in the scripture that they will try to attribute to the prophet at hand without even giving the possibility. All right, once again, you're now listening to Debate Talk for You. The title of this debate is The New Testament Relevant. Is the New Testament relevant? My special guest is Rabbi Asher Meza and Zadok Ben Israel. The number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Once again, I appreciate uh, a lot more people are coming in and uh, listening to the show via phone. And I really appreciate you guys for tuning in to Debate Talk for you. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, hold on. Once we get to the public Q&A, we're going to get to you guys. But I'm going to go down in order and take your questions. So if you, if you know you're going to have a question, you can press number one. And, of course, when I get to the public Q&A, I'm going to get to you in order. What about now? We're in a rebuttal part of this debate. That's going to be 10 minutes each. So we're going to go back to Rabbi Asher Meza. Let me uh, set up the timer, and you can go ahead, brother. Speaking about the historicity of Jesus, I'm not sure if many Christians actually know that there is no historian book about Jesus. None at all. The only one that some try to slightly attribute any sort of reference to Jesus in his works was Josephus. And virtually every Christian historian and theologian admits that it was added by the church. Now we have other historians like Pliny the Younger and Tacitus that speak about the followers of Jesus but not about the existence, the life, the death, the crucifixion, and resurrection of a man named Jesus. Now, the Talmud brings down the names of many different heretical individuals that may or may have not been referring to Jesus. As a matter of fact, the closest individual that in some way resembles the person of Jesus actually existed 250 years before the supposed birth of Jesus, around the time of the Maccabees. Just to lay that as precedent, in case people are fooled into believing that Jesus is an actual historical figure. Now, someone might say, well, can we prove the existence of Moses? Could we validate the flood or the splitting of the Sea of Reeds? You know what? We don't have to. The commandments in Torah speak for themselves. How do we know Torah is true? How do we know Torah is divine? Because it has been the only book, the only book, that has been able to pacify and civilize the world. How are you expected to know the New Testament is true? Out of faith, out of faith of some supposed resurrection, and out of faith of a supposed rapture and second coming. Where is this in Torah? They'll tell you foreshadowings, the Yom Kippur sacrifice. Of course it mentions a goat, but hey, a lamb is close enough, mentions nothing of human blood. But a man dying on the cross is enough, close enough at least. Whole doctrines, 
whole movement built on nothing. And you have the majority of humanity putting down the Torah and picking up a New Testament to lead them. Doesn't this sound disrespectful to a God who loved us so much, to a God who loved humanity so much, not that he gave you his only begotten son, but he gave you a higher standard to aspire to. When man was walking on his knees like an animal, the Almighty intervened. And he said, no, that's not where you belong. I'm going to give you my instructions. I'm going to give you my guidebook for living so you can begin behaving like I do because I'm the standard of goodness. Of course, you have a book that appears hundreds, perhaps thousands of years later, claims to be the final nail on that cross, let's say. A book that now explains the complexities of God. He's no longer one. He's three now. Oh, but he became a man. He sacrificed himself unto himself. And anyone who's not familiar with the clear Hebrew in Isaiah 53 knows that when it says that he is dying for the sins of humanity, they wouldn't know that for there is because of, not in behalf of. The truth is Isaiah 53 is speaking about every prophet that has ever come. And yes, Jewish tradition does teach that Isaiah was killed. Like virtually any prophet that the Almighty has sent to the Jewish people, Isaiah suffered. Jeremiah suffered. And if you believe Yehoshua is the Mashiach, then you shouldn't exclude him either. By definition, if the Jewish people, in their low state, in their walk with darkness, are trying to be brought near by God, what do you think the messenger, the servant of the Almighty is going to go through? Of course he's going to get beat up. Of course he's going to have his beard torn off. That's just common sense. But the problem is there's too many preconceived notions floating around here that a man could die for your sins. Whatever happened to free will? Vicarious atonement does not exist in Torah. Come and just take upon his shoulders all the sins of the world? And that in some way is supposed to be considered just? It's supposed to be fair? I thought God was a good God. And that's really the difference between Jewish theology and Christian theology. Christians follow God because he's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. Jews follow God because first and foremost, God is good and worthy to be followed. Pagan gods call the dime a dozen, claiming the exact same thing. I created you. You owe me. I can do whatever you want, and my ways are higher than your ways, and you'll never understand it. I guess the New Testament God could fall in those ranks also. The God of the Tanakh wanted to solidify a greater relationship with humanity. He wanted us to love him because he loved us first. Can you imagine a God who was going to cast you into hell forever and needed to sacrifice himself unto himself? I mean, does that even make any sense to anyone? If it doesn't make sense, why do you stay in this religion? It's time for a change. It's time to go back to our roots, to return to Torah. And that's why I'm here tonight, to give you a message that perhaps you've never heard before, that the Almighty loves you, but he loves you so much that he gives you the opportunity to fail. He loves you so much that he gives you standards and not some cop-out. The way you make this world a better place is by making the world a better place, not by accepting some sacrifice in your behalf. Does that sound intelligent? Does it sound ethical? Think about that tonight, because the Almighty is waiting for you to come back, my friends. And I would like if the conversation would stick <laughs> or remain what it was intended to be, and that is the New Testament relevant. Not proving if Jesus is the Messiah according to the Tanakh, but the actual text of the New Testament, is it relevant? So now I've never even heard of a Christian group walking around only with the Tanakh and saying, you know what, I can prove everything I believe from the Tanakh, and especially not the Torah. It doesn't exist. Why? Because the majority of Christian doctrine is built by Paul. As a matter of fact, most Christian or Messianic Jews do not build doctrine on the words of Jesus. All right, once again, you're now listening to Debate Talk for You Radio. The title of this debate, Is the New Testament Relevant? Is the New Testament Relevant? So far, a lot of people are right now standing by, uh, sending me emails, letting me know they're enjoying this debate. And uh, special shout out to the people that's overseas, international listeners right now that's listening in the U.K. and Canada and all across the globe. I uh, really appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, during the public Q&A, for those people that's overseas, if you want to call in, you can call in via Skype with 
the same number, 646-716-7320, that will guarantee you that you can ask your question during our live Q&A segments. All right, so we're going to go to Zadok Ben Israel right now for his rebuttal. That's going to be 10 minutes each. Let me open up his phone line, and you can go ahead, brother. Well, I guess the reason that Brother Neza never met Christians or Messianics who could use the Torah and the Tanakh to prove uh, Hamashiach is because we are the esoteric ones. We are the one. We, we are the small group who have been given the ability to see. Now, one thing that I would say. <laughs> is he himself stated in our pre-debate discussion that Paul, Peter, and others, when they spoke, and even Yeshua himself, we could show it myriads of times, when they spoke, they did not speak out of the New Testament. He said that himself, it's in the archive, go look it up. He said that they will refer you to the prophets. Now, I I only read Acts chapter 8 to show that Philip when he went to speak with the Ethiopian eunuch, actually started in Isaiah where the eunuch was reading and started to preach unto him Jesus. Yeshua himself said, uh, search the scriptures. He told this to the Sanhedrin. Search the scriptures, for in them you believe you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So he can admit at least that the claim of the New Testament believers who actually preached Christ and who walked with Christ, everything that they did was out of the Old Testament because what's called New Testament wasn't written yet. Now, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to address the idea of no vicarious sacrifice in Torah. The word vicarious, brothers and sisters, basically means no substitute sacrifice. Now, even though Yahweh said in his prophets a couple of times that I desire not the blood of bulls and goats, but he desired obedience, yes, that's true. That's what he desired. But that's not what he got. And because that's not what he got, he set in place the concept of vicarious sacrifice, meaning what? An animal died, an animal's blood was given in place of a man or a woman unless they had did something that was actually unto death. But we do see David, Brother Neza actually tried to, uh, in our debate, uh, pre-debate discussion, he actually tried to rail on on Hamashiach because he did not agree with the people stoning the woman who they claimed they caught right in the middle of committing adultery. But yet, we see that the Creator left room for atonement and forgiveness of even sin that was unto death. The man who he loved, David, committed premeditated murder and adultery and got a woman pregnant. And Yahweh forgave his sin and wiped away that iniquity as far as the judgment of him having to die, but yet he made him pay the rest of his life in many ways. So, brothers and sisters, when we see the creator giving the concept of something being able to die for your sin, and I can forgive even sin that I, in my own law, said everyone deserves to die. The Torah teaches us that he is no respecter of persons and that he don't favor the rich and he don't twist judgment for, the, um, for a poor man in his cause. Everyone is judged by his statutes, yet he left room because he said, I have mercy upon whom I will. Vicarious sacrifice is shown in Isaiah chapter 53 when the creator actually said that this servant, this servant who would suffer for the nation and for the sins of men would give his soul as an offering for sin. So that's one place. And then we also have the myriad understanding of what the sacrificing stood for and even what the temple stood for. And I doubt if many of the orthodoxy even deal with these things. Brother Nether also claimed and said that uh, the Torah was good enough alone because it civilized humanity. Yet he said 
And people would say, well, what proof do you have of things like Moses splitting the sea of reeds? And he dismissed it. Oh, well, that's not necessary. But then said, when we talk about the death, the resurrection, the miracles of the Hamashiach that I uh, eyewitness testified to in the writings of his followers, he says we believe those things through faith. But you know why he dismissed it? Because he tried to basically get away with one, but we won't let him tonight. Brother Mezzan knows that he believes through faith what happened to Egypt. There are no records of the Egyptians of these things happening to them. There are no other nations around to corroborate the story in any of their annals in history that all of this happened, that they ran into this people in the wilderness, and they had to fight these people. There is no, uh, uh, um, there is no outside source. Like he says, there is no uh, 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 one who historically testifies of Jesus. You know that the same can be said for Moses? Do you know that the same can be said for Elijah, the prophet? Do you know that the same can be said for Abraham? But because nations claim to be descendants of his, hey, we accept it. What about Cain and Abel? What about Enoch? What about that? There is no, nothing written in any annals outside the writings of the nation that gives any historical proof of these people. We, I, him, you all, believe everything in the Old Testament by faith. And the only reason why we deal with the commandments is not because it's the only thing that civilized all humanity. It's many nations that will argue against that point. But because we believe in the things that was done and the God who hand was a part of these things, redeemed the nation out of captivity, and he gave them this law as a template for the rest of humanity. But that's not, but the reason we believe Torah isn't simply because it's good, but everything around it leading up to the giving of the Torah is what we believe in by faith. Also, my brothers and my sisters, I want to read you something. Let us go to the book of Genesis right quick because I know i got 10 minutes. I'm going to establish something here, and I want the brother to respond. Let us go to uh, let us go to uh, 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 Genesis chapter five and verse one. Genesis five and one, and when we get there, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When we go to Genesis five and one, we're going to establish here that what this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam in the day they were created. Now, brothers and sisters, male and female together is Adam. Not Adams, but Adam. And Adam is a plural and singular word. The male and the female are echad in the Hebrew, and he in the pre-debate established that. That when Adam, that when it says um, the two shall be one, that they shall be echad. Brothers and sisters. This is the idea of any possibility that anyone could see in the New Testament as far as the concept of there being three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that a lot of the Trinitarian churches try to establish the idea of a trinity where the Holy Spirit is God and God the Father, God the Son. That's not what I'm on. But he's going to 1 John 5 to try and establish and speak against that point that there are three that bear record in heaven. And these three are one. And, it's, and he said that then they established this Holy Ghost or this Holy Spirit. But brothers and sisters, in Isaiah 63 and 10, Yahweh himself said that they rebelled against his Holy Spirit. And therefore, he turned to be their enemy and fought against them, referring to an angel as the Holy Spirit who he had in the wilderness with the fathers. So is the New Testament relevant? Yes, it doesn't take away from or add unto Torah, but yet it is a continuing story of things that were prophesied, which he called esoteric statements of the prophets, and these things come in the past, brothers and sisters, things in the New Testament written that as they happen in the past, people witnessed to these things and wrote them down. So it is a continuation letting us know that Yahweh's word is continuing to come to pass, and there's more to come. So, yes, the New Testament is relevant, so I got some questions to ask him when we get into our question and answer segment. Thanks. 
All right, once again, you're now listening to Debate Talk View Radio. The title of this debate, for those people that just joined into the show, is the New Testament relevant? Is the New Testament relevant? My special guest is Rabbi Asher Meza, and to document Israel, the number is 646-716-7320. If you have any questions later on, once again, the number is 646-716-7320. Once you call in, just press the number one. And, of course, I'll add you into the conversation. Uh, later on, there's going to be a public Q&A segment, and we're getting closer and closer to that public Q&A. So once that happens, I'm going to go down in order and take your questions. But right about now, we're into the cross-examination part of this debate. Now, for the cross-examination, each person has prepared several questions to ask one another. So we're going to get into that right about now. We're going to start off with Rabbi Asher asking questions to Zadok Ben Israel. So we're going to open up both brothers' phone lines. And, Rabbi, you can go ahead with your questions, brother. I would like to ask the brother if he believes that a Jew, an Israelite, that keeps what the Torah commands him to keep, under the auspices of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 12, where it tells us that the Torah is not in heaven, that someone tries to dissuade another from trying to keep it. If an Israelite keeps Torah, will that person be rejected by God for not accepting a concept that appeared after Torah? And if so, why? Uh, okay, good question. Well, I will say this. If a person actually does keep Torah and they don't turn to the right hand or the left, then I have no ground to stand on and say that Yahweh uh, 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 would not have mercy upon them, that they wouldn't be accepted by him or anything of that nature. But I would say this, is that as we read in the book of Leviticus chapter 4, the scripture actually tells us that if one sent through ignorance against any of the commandments, that that person, when they are, when that sin or that thing that they trespassed in against the Creator is brought to their attention and they accept it, then they were to make an offering for sin. So at the end of the day, whether a person keeps Torah fully, I can't say because I haven't seen anyone that has ever kept Torah fully and haven't sinned in a part. And because I haven't found anyone that has not sinned, uh, maybe if you could point out someone historically, uh, you let me know. Since, but since I have not written, ever read that in Torah, I see the constant necessity of a sacrifice. And if the sacrifice is obedience, what happens when, for instance, I commit fornication, I sleep with a, I sleep with a man's wife, I am a thief. The Torah said I should be stoned to death. So what would happen to me now? I, I really don't know without there being a sacrifice made in some, in some way in the sight of the Creator to forgive me and atone for that sin. Yes, you can respond, brother. That doesn't really answer my question. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 12 through 13, telling us about the Torah. It says that it is not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will or can ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? Now, the brother said that the Torah demands us to keep it perfectly or it's equivalent to us not keeping it at all. And he just reiterated the point I made in the last debate, that sacrifices are for unintentional sins. If there are for unintentional sins, how can Yeshua's sacrifice atone for even intentional sins? I mean, not to mention that the Torah never even mentioned human sacrifice. I think that the brother didn't understand the question clearly because I said that if the Torah itself does not command you to believe something, how can God hold you accountable for not believing it? So that's really my issue here. Um, And also, how can it judge you for a supposed commandment that appears in the prophets or that people say appears in the prophets, the notion of there being a Messiah, who, according to the brother, is going to atone for all of our sins. If everything we do is based on Torah, like the countless times it tells us in Scripture that Hashem only judges us on whether we keep the commandments or we do not keep the commandments, how can a good God then toss a faithful Jew into damnation for not accepting his son? And my last statement here is that he specifically says he's not in a place to judge to assume that if someone doesn't accept Yeshua but keeps the Torah perfectly, He's not in a place to condemn that person, but the New Testament does. The New Testament countless times says that if someone does not accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they're damned. 
Do we consider that as an addition? Is that a blatant contradiction of what's in Torah? No, I don't believe so. Well, you just said you can't condemn everyone or anyone, but the New Testament is condemning them on a notion that doesn't appear well, in Torah. Well, I actually spoke it in the context of someone who kept Torah without breaking it. But someone who halfway keeps Torah and halfway sins throughout their life um, is, another, is another story. And the reason why, is, and, I, and I can tell you the reason why I and many others are convinced of that at the time that they spoke what they spoke in the New Testament, that it was valid from that time forward is because of what's written in Deuteronomy chapter 18, which they in the New Testament quoted and understood that the prophet that Moses spoke of was revealed in the person of Yeshua of Nazareth. And I'll go there right quick. It's written in Deuteronomy 18.18, and it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So Yeshua actually came and came and he claimed that everything he spoke, he said, everything I say to you is that which I heard my father speak unto me, and everything I do is what is the thing that my father showed me to do. So he is the one we believe, and not just us, but we believe through the witness of those who were his followers that, hey, this is the one who Moses spoke of. He is just like Moses, and that would be a whole other time trying to teach that. But if you want to know, this is one of the scriptures in Torah before you get to the prophets that we believe establishes the prophet who would come like Moses. And whoever didn't listen to this prophet, would he spoke in God's name, Yahweh would require it of him. So this prophet could change God's words then? Because it says in Deuteronomy no, 18 that the prophet could change whether he will speak God's my word. word. In other words, the words that are already established in Torah. But you just said that Jesus could so, add to that, or well, whatever that is, prophet could add to it. Well, it. well, things that the prophets, many prophets who came between Yeshua and Moses, the things that they told the people uh, 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 that were established in uh, the Torah, yes, the people had to keep it. And what Yeshua taught, everything he taught is backed by the Torah, as far as I understand. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, Isaiah says, If anyone does not speak according to this word, the word of God, they have no light in it. In other words, their words have no light in it. The job of the prophet was always only to amplify Torah. As a matter of fact, in that portion in Deuteronomy where it tells us to test the prophet, it says if he comes and he changes one word of Torah, take him out and stone him because he's false. Now, when it says in Deuteronomy 18 that he's going to have the words of the Almighty in his lips. He's going to speak my words. It doesn't mean that he has the authority to speak like God does, but he's reiterating from the well, from the foundation, that never changes. If it was like that, like why would God say don't add or don't take away, but prophets are allowed to? And if not, why can Muhammad, who also claimed to be a prophet, or Joseph Smith, who also claimed to be a prophet, come and change the Torah? Because enough changing around, you end up with a whole new religion, and by definition, the Torah cannot destroy itself. Well, brother, all I can say to you is that we would have to deal with the things that show that Yeshua taught against the Torah, because at the end of the day, I'm telling you that, he did not teach against the Torah, but you mm -hmm. constantly are saying that. So you know, um, as we go well, the through the New Testament, this, says uh, it. it says, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. Anyone who basically wants to get to the Father has to go through me." But can you tell me where does that appear in Torah? That's actually not written uh, in the Torah. Your 10 minutes is up. Once again, you're listening to Debate Talk View Radio. The title of this debate, for those people that just joined into the show, is the New Testament relevant? Is the New Testament relevant? My special guest is Zadok Ben Israel and Rabbi Asher Meza. The number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. Right about now, we're in a cross-examination part of this debate. And after this cross-examination, we're going to take a five-minute intermission. Then after that, we're going to have a second rebuttal, and after that will be the public Q&A where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions and your comments. I'll dial in the number once again, 646-716-7320. So right about now, this is a document Israel's time to ask questions to Rabbi Asher. Then we're going to set the timer really quickly, and you can go ahead. Okay. 
Thanks. Uh, Brother Meza, if you would turn to, uh, to Genesis chapter 49 and get to knock, um, I, I, I want to get your take on, on a part that I'm going to point out here. Uh, in Genesis chapter 49, I'm reading out of my Tanakh here, and it says uh, in verse 1, Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Assemble yourselves, and I will tell you what will befall you in the end of days. So we know that what Jacob is discussing here is uh, not only for their life, but also for the end of their posterity. So, for instance, just like the people is called Jacob, uh, the tribe is called Judah, or the tribe is after the name of their fathers, this isn't just for the individual, but this is for their posterity through time. And if we go down to uh, verse 10, it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a scholar from among his descendants until Shiloh arrive, and his will be an assemblage of nations. He will tie his donkey to the vine. To the vine branches, donkeys fall. He will launder his garments and wine and his robe in the blood of grace. What is the understanding in the Orthodox Jewish uh, teaching on what this may possibly point to? There isn't a set understanding. There's many different opinions. The most popular opinion is that this is talking about the Messiah in an esoteric sense, but even that statement has no authority to it because it's just an opinion. The truth is, no one knows exactly what this verse is saying, and it would fall under that portion in Deuteronomy 29, 29 that teaches us that in areas that seem to be not revealed, revealed in the sense that if you ask the same question to five different rabbis, you'll get eight opinions, and even the average Christian can respond. The average Muslim can give you a definitive answer. Some even believe it's talking about Joseph Smith. So I can't build doctrine on an esoteric portion like this. Okay. Anyways... So it's, this is not oh, go ahead. an instructional portion of the Torah. As a matter of fact, okay. we see errors made by Jacob himself here when he's blessing the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Shimon. It says that they are to remain a violent group, ferocious, and it's the opposite. The Levites become the stewards of the temple and the tribe where the Kohanim and the priests derive from. So to well, try to build well, doctrine... Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, uh, you got into Levi, and that's cool, but I just wanted to know what your understanding was on Judah. And the reason why I brought this here is because I understand, I mean, even in the Tanakh that I have, uh, 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 the rabbis who, who actually wrote um, their opinions in this actually speak of it possibly referring to a Messiah, but they said it's similar to what you said, that there are varying degrees of, of, of argument on this topic. Now, the reason why I went here is because when we had the pre-debate discussion, you established that, 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 that the idea of a Messiah, or, 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 or actually, I'm sorry, you said the term the Messiah is not in Torah, but right. we see here, and you just established that, yes, there is that, that there are many who believe, even in your uh, uh, realm, who believe that this is pointing to uh, uh, um, a Messiah. Now, if you would, go over to Zechariah chapter 9 right quick for me. And the only reason why I'm going here, what does this have to do with the New Testament? Because the, at the end of the day, the whole thing about it is, as you said yourself, the New Testament has many, uh, uh, has a lot of good moral stories and things like that, but we established that it has a lot of good doctrine last week as well. And here in Zechariah 9 and 9, here is something else. That, so before we move to the next, I'm sorry. But I just have to respond about this notion because I think perhaps you misunderstood me last week. The notion of messiahs, people who are anointed for service, whether you're a high priest, a king, or a prophet, does appear in the Torah. Absolutely. Right. It yeah, appears yeah, in the writing. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But the notion of yeah, yeah, a, yeah, no you know, a specific messiah, some sort of redeemer or savior, it's not there. Now, here well, is what well, we know. Well, hey, hey, Hold well, on. Hey, uh, here, well, well, Here's well, where we know say, Brother Meza, the kings have to come Brother from Meza, the tribe of Judah. Brother Meza, Brother Meza, for the sake of time, for the sake of time, I want to get to my next point. Um, at the end of the day, we're establishing here that there is someone that is going to come through Judah, and this one, the assembling of the nations shall be to this one. So this isn't just a king of Israel who rules over Israel and who kicks out the Canaanites or keeps them in subjection, but this person here, it's someone who will have rule over the nations of the earth. Now, if I go to Zechariah chapter 9, and I read here, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. 
He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, do you believe that there is any possibility that this esoteric statement and the one that we just read previously in Genesis have any correlation with one another? No. I'll tell you why. Because okay. the portion in Genesis is not limiting it to one person. Every king of Israel, with the exception of Saul, came from Judah. They were anointed for service. So, I mean, this doesn't establish the basis of one who is coming in terms of... Well, we disagree. We disagree. Uh, we right, disagree right, right. because, because just giving you the, my... nation, the, nation, uh-huh. the nations are not gathered unto just any old king out of the tribe of Judah. This is one individual we're speaking of here. Not Don't make this many individuals. <laughs> History would teach you. one individual in Genesis 49 of because out of your own mouth, well, hey, Brother Mezzer, for that, for the sake of time, you and I would just disagree there because you established that in your own doctrine. You all can't agree on what this exactly means, but you are totally dismissing what the, uh, another possibility of what it means. So you established that y'all don't fully agree in your own uh, church. If you would answer me this question, mm-hmm. do you? Uh, uh, what happened to Enoch? What is the teaching in your um, organization on what happened to Enoch? says what it says. <laughs> We're not going to build a whole doctrine. Is, huh? And, and that, that is, Almighty took him up. He says, but that he lived so many years, and then he walked with God. Now, what does that teach you? Mm-hmm. Well, that Enoch is Yahushua, oh. like Messianics teach? I mean, that's kind of building a lot of doctrine on, on something really? that is completely esoteric. So let me ask you something. Would I, I, you believe I, that Enoch I is Jesus? You, I, see, 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 what you're doing, you're so defensive against the Messiah that you want to run to anything that you think I'm trying to say. I, I want to know. The world want to know. We don't deal with Orthodox Jews every day here. If you listen to debate talk for you, it's usually Christians and Israelites, you know, going back and forth, and sometimes atheists. You, I believe, are the first Orthodox Jew I've heard. So I want to know, and I think the people will probably want to know, what do y'all teach? I didn't ask you about Jesus or doctrine. It's written in the Torah. What do y'all believe happened to Enoch? I'm trying to teach you the way we learn Torah. Can we don't go and build a whole question? doctrine. Hold on, hold on. Question? We don't go and okay. Okay. build a whole doctrine. Time. I want, I, I want to move to another question. To... <laughs> right, what are the time You're asking me these questions that are not absolute. Question. There's no answer to these questions. Okay. Of course, okay, cool. there's yeah. an answer no in your problem. mind. Your okay. answer is always going to start with a J okay. and end with an S. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, hold on, Rabbi. Rabbi. Yeah, hold on, Rabbi. Rabbi. Yeah, 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 Asher. Yeah, that. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. You all, you all don't know what happened to Enoch. Okay, cool. Let's go to one Come more. On. Now, this would be my last question because simply, you see, this man is here to he he here to fight against the truth tonight. Jeremiah chapter twenty three. Let's go to Jeremiah twenty three. And when we get to Jeremiah 23, I'm going to ask you, what do you all teach that this means? And prayerfully, you'll tell us what this means and not argue about some kind of doctrine that's trying to be established. We simply want to know if there's people who think any of this points to Jesus, you just tell us the ulterior version of what you all understand it to be because we know that none of this, you, any of you believe, points to uh, Yeshua of Nazareth, so 23 and 5. Behold, the days come, saith Yah, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch. And a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and justice in earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, Yahweh Sadat. So what do you all teach that this means? In Torah, it teaches us that when we're in exile, where are we at right now? Once we repent, the Almighty is going to bring us back from all the corners of the world. He's going to bring us back to Israel. We're going to have a king again. He's going to be from the line of Judah through David. None of this here was fulfilled by Jesus, by the way. Christians say, well, he's going to do it when he comes. All right, time is up. Once again, you're listening to Debate Talk for You Radio. The title of this debate is the New Testament relevant? Is the New Testament relevant? Hopefully you guys are taking down your notes. A lot, a lot of you guys are enjoying this debate. 
so far. It's been a classic so far. Right about now, we're going to take a five-minute intermission break, a five-minute intermission break, you know, give my special guest some time to gather some more notes or get to get some water. All right, so we're going to be right back, guys. Stay up. Okay, we are back. Once again, you're listening to Debate Talk for You, Season 3. Once again, the title of this debate, Is the New Testament Relevant? Is the New Testament relevant? So far, a lot of great reviews right now on this particular debate, and I appreciate all of you guys that's listening via phone by dialing the number 646-716-7320. Right about now, we're going into the second rebuttal part of this debate. That's going to be seven minutes each, and right after the second rebuttal is my favorite part of the show, the public Q&A, where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions and your comments. Uh, if you guys like, if you know you're going to have a question, you can press the number one right now. You can press number one right now. I'm going to go down in order and take your questions. But that's the part of the show. Once again, public Q&A, where you, the listening audience, will call in with your questions and your comments. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of time to ask your questions and your comments through the high volume of callers. Of course, I'm going to ask you guys to show respect to my special guests. And, of course, no foul language is permitted. We keep things clean here at Debate Talk for you. You know, keep it professional. So let's get into the second rebuttal, guys. Let's get into the second rebuttal. We're going to start off with Rabbi Asher Meza with the second rebuttal. Once again, that's seven minutes each. Let me just set the phone, uh, the timer. Hold on for a second. And you could go ahead, Rabbi. I'd like to clarify a few things your brother said. I think that he believes that I don't believe in a Messiah. Not true at all. I believe in the words of Torah. What does the Torah have to say about our future king? Torah tells us that the Israelites in the wilderness were warned that after they received the Torah, they're going to fall again. God's going to end up exiling them from their promised land. And only when they repent are they going to be brought back and things will go on like they did in the past. In other words, they're going to elect a king. But really, it's not just any king. It's a king, a righteous king like David. So that's what all these portions of the prophets is speaking about. Things that clearly Yehoshua never fulfilled, which is why the doctrine of the second coming had to be created. Well, under those auspices, I guess I could be the Messiah. Just wait for my second coming for me to fulfill those exhaustive and exclusive prophecies. Don't let anyone think I don't believe in a Messiah, a coming king. If I would say that, I wouldn't believe in Torah. The Torah tells me to believe in a Messiah, commanded me to establish a king. The thing is, Christians first choose Jesus and try to justify him within the words of the prophets. And regarding Enoch and every esoteric verse that the brother brought up from the Torah, sometimes it's better build doctrines on things that are not there, like assuming that Enoch is Yehoshua, that the angel before the Lord is Yehoshua, that Yehoshua is in every page of Torah. Sounds like an addiction. Where is God? And if it wasn't for these foreshadowings, would Christianity even exist? I typically always ask... Christians who are aware of my ministry to give a response for what they believe. In other words, they know that as an Orthodox Jew, the acceptable response would have to be one based on Torah, or at least on something we both consider authoritative. In other words, he or she would know that just by telling a Jew that I believe in X and Y, because the New Testament tells me so, wouldn't really answer my questions. Why? Because Orthodox Jews do not believe in the New Testament. So, I usually jump to the point and ask them if they can justify what they believe within the five books of Moses alone. And not just the five books of Moses alone, but the portions of the five books of Moses that we're commanded to adhere to. Countless times, open up your Strong's Concordance and check for statutes and decrees. The Almighty countless times tells us He only punishes us. He gives us a hint on why we would get punished and why we would get blessed. And that's for not keeping, for not adhering to the do's and don'ts in the Torah. Now, this notion that (laughs) if you cannot keep the Torah completely, you're hopeless and doomed to hell, does not appear in Torah, by the way. There's a lot of things that Christians repeat over and over again, and they fail to realize that it's something that Christianity itself has created. Why can we keep every commandment in Torah? Because there's some commandments that are only for priests. There are some commandments that are only for women. There are some commandments that could only be kept in Eretz Yisrael. All he wants you to do is to try to keep Torah. He tells you, we just read it. The verse that says that the Torah is not in heaven, lest anyone dissuade you and say, nail it to the cross. 
You need some sacrifice to forgive your sins. Repentance is not enough. Torah is near to us. Why would he give you a set of laws you're not able to keep? To in some way laugh and say, ha ha, you always needed blood, and not just blood, but my blood, to be offered to myself. Does this make any sense to you? And if it doesn't, then you're finally realizing that the New Testament and the Torah cannot be combined. It's either one or the other. Why only Torah? Countless times the Torah says that blessings and cursings only come upon Israel for not keeping the Almighty's Hukim and his Mishpatim. So knowing this, why would we assume that the Almighty would then hold us accountable for not adhering to supposedly new ideas uttered by the prophets? I believe the way these individuals are able to create all these supposedly new doctrines from the prophets is because they don't really understand Hebrew and are looking Tanakh with New Testament glasses and not the other way around. So that's my rebuttal. All right, once again, the number is 646-716-7320. You're now listening to Debate Talk Free Radio Season 3. The title of this debate is The New Testament Relevant. Is the New Testament Relevant? My special guest is Dr. Israel and Rabbi Asher Meza. We're still in the second rebuttal part of this debate, but right after the second rebuttal, we're going to go to the public Q&A. You, the people, are going to ask your questions and your comments. Uh, feel free to call in with your questions and your comments. Let your voice be heard. The number is 646-716-7320. Once you call in, all you got to do is press the number one, and I'm going to add you into the conversation. We're going to give you a limited time to ask your question and your comments. So right now, let's go to, to Doc Benigio with a second rebuttal. That's going to be seven minutes. Let me open up his phone line, and go ahead, brother. Well, this is interesting. I will say this. Brother Meza is passionate. But passion and correctness are not to be confused with one another. There are many listening tonight, Brother Meza, believe it or not, uh, who are of the uh, Hebrew, uh, the, the, the black Hebrew movement, who don't believe uh, that Yeshua was uh, the promised Messiah. So you have some on tonight. I, I, I would beg to really believe that you really have someone tonight who would probably agree with your, uh, a lot of your stance. And I've dealt with some of them already. And you, just like them, have done a new thing. I didn't even have to punch you in the face. You actually just hit my hand with your face. And why do I say that? Because it was real cool, real cool, how you, after five minutes to think about it, you know you put yourself in a corner. And so what you did was you tried to come back on and clean up your understanding of Messiah, but yet you established, when I went to Genesis 49 and asked you what that meant and what do you all teach, you said there was no clear agreement on what that means. So we can't believe that what you explained after five minutes was up. It's correct, can we? All we can say is this is what Meza and most likely your brethren, your circle, or who you are among, this is the conclusion you have come unto, but yet there are others of the orthodoxy who would say different. There are some of them who would even say, man, that's David. And you all would say, that can't possibly be David. So understand that because you said what you said, first impressions are everything. You told us when in your teaching they say when eight rabbis are saying eight different things, then you leave it in the air. See, you all leave it in the air, and that's the problem with you all. You all are following right into the example that the New Testament teaches against, the point where you think you are so saved by the law, but yet you can't explain that when you commit adultery, that when you commit fornication, and you already know the law, how is it that you can know the law, do something like that one time, and then come back? Now, David is not the rule. David was an exception. But many in the history of other people were thrown to death and slain for the same two wicked acts that David did. One thing I'm going to say to you is this. This is interesting. You got on here and said, Christians say a person is doomed to hell if they don't keep all the Torah. And you had to say that generalizing Christians because you know I never said that. I never said that. So that's one thing that you are misunderstanding. What I'm saying is if you don't keep Torah and you sin through ignorance, then you have to make an offering for sin. And for those who are, who were put to death, brothers and sisters, a sacrifice had to be made. See, in the land, they made sacrifices every year, especially during Yom Kippur, for the sin of the congregation, 
and, and in case they were sending the priest's house, he made a, a sacrifice for that. Brothers and sisters, there is vicarious sacrifice constantly in the Torah, and the only reason it's not being done now with animals, if you ask him, it's simply because the people are in the land. But even according to his doctrine, after the regathering of the people, sacrifice will be done again. The book of Ezekiel establishes that the line of Aaron will continue through Zadok, or through the line of Zadok and his son. I also never said that Jesus was Enoch. Do you see how he implies? Who to, I want to know who teaches that Jesus is Enoch. We're not Jehovah Witnesses either. We don't believe that Michael the Archangel and this, that is Jesus. We, all of these things he's insinuating don't have anything to do with the New Testament. The New Testament don't teach that. I never said it. So when I asked him the question, what do you all teach happened to Enoch, the man slipped and tap danced around that like when you stump at a dog on a linoleum floor in the kitchen and you just hear them nails just tapping around, just trying to get away. That's what he did. Go back in the archives and look at it. And he tried to clean it up by bringing it back up like, and who said Enoch is Jesus? What is this? No one ever said that, but your heart, is so keen against the Messiah, who you left license for the whole audience tonight to believe is a possibility. And the only reason why I'm dealing with the Messiah is not because I want to deal totally with trying to prove tonight that Jesus is the Messiah, but your whole purpose against the New Testament is the fallacy that Jesus is the Messiah and was the Son of God, died and resurrected. But as I established in our pre-debate, as I established in our pre-debate discussion, you believe that a man was thrown in a grave and touched the bones of a dead prophet, and this man came to life off the bones of a dead prophet. So we have, and I have to believe that by faith. So is my faith so far set to believe that God resurrected a man from the dead? No. You believe a man was created grown without no mother and father before him, and then he was put to sleep, and his rib was open, and a woman a whole woman was made from his rib. You believe that through faith. So is, so is it far fetched for me to believe that God through his power could cause a woman to become pregnant and not need a man? Come on. What you believe is through faith and what I believe is through faith. And I will establish this. Brothers and sisters, he don't know the answer to Shiloh nor the rabbis because they call all that esoteric because the Lord never meant for their people to understand it. It has been given to Israel. We are Israel. And the Lord has given us an understanding that the world still doesn't comprehend. When you go to Matthew 21 and you see that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the donkey with her foal next to her and all the poor and oppressed of the people crowned him and cried that he is the son of David, Hosanna unto the son of David, blessed be him in the name of the highest. That's when they knew they had to put Jesus to death because he was taking the people. So this brother tonight is saying that all the, the followers of Jesus were liars. All the poor in Jerusalem were out of their mind by following this man. No, that's not what happened. What happened is the Messiah has been revealed. And just like David was anointed king, and it took some decades for it to be realized until he came into the fullness of his throne, you have to understand how the kingdom of God starts and grows till Yeshua comes into the fullness of his throne. But as it said in Daniel 2, that kingdom hit in the days of the Roman Empire, brother. Okay, once again, you're listening to Debate Talk Free Radio. The title of this debate is The New Testament Relevant. Is the New Testament Relevant? Right about now, this is my favorite part of the show, the public Q&A, where you, the listening audience, can call in with your questions and your comments by dialing the number 646-716-7320, pressing the number 1. And, of course, I'll add you to the conversation. Once again, feel free to call in. Let your voice be heard. Is the New Testament relevant? Do you agree? Do you disagree? You know the number, 646-716-7320. So let's go to the people. Let's see what the people have to say. Let's see. Uh, 316-716. No, it's 316-617. I'm sorry. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. 316-617. Do you have any questions or comments? Uh, Shalom. Al, Brother Zadok, and Mr. Asher, this is Yosef in Israel. Hey, how you doing, Yosef? How you doing, brother? Keep on, brother. Uh, I have a statement that I want to make first, and I would like to hear a response to these scriptures that I'm going to read. 
Now, Mr. Asher said that no historian talked about Jesus except for Josephus, but that's not actually true. Uh, uh, there is another one, and his name was Cornelius Tacitus, and he wrote the Annals of Imperial Rome. And when you go to page 216, it says that Christ suffered death by Pontius Pilate, which you can find in John chapter 18, 28 through 40, and in chapter 19. Now, the scripture that I'm going to read is 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try to experience whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now is it in the world. And the last scripture is First John, uh, Second John chapter 1, verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world to confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an Antichrist. Now I would like to hear a response to these scriptures. If you go back to the archives and hear what I said, I said that there's three sources, Pliny the Younger, Tacitus, and Josephus. Josephus is the only source used to show that he actually existed and not as a later reference to some historical story. So I did mention Tacitus, and I mentioned Pliny the Younger also. Now, regarding New Testament scripture, I don't hold it as authoritative, so I mean, I don't really think... I should even respond to that. All right, guys. Zadok, you want to reply? Guys, Zadok. Well, I would say it in this regard that what has happened tonight, uh, and I think the brother, I believe he said his name was Yosef, um, what has happened is, is that Brother Nezah has rejected the Messiah. And what has happened is this. He admits there is a Messiah that they are waiting for who will come 2,000 years after the captivity, Right? But no. in establishing that, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, no. giving uh, my answer. You gave your answer. So Rob, you're misquoting me. Day, yeah, we'll let you reply. Oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll let you reply. We'll let you reply. Right, right, uh, right. Later. Yeah. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, in Deuteronomy 18, the prophet that would come like unto Moses, who the people should hear, the ones who would speak in Yahweh's name, and whatever he say in Yahweh's name, those who don't accept what he says, it will be required of them. This is basically what is happening. They have rejected Yeshua of Nazareth because at the end of the day, there has to be some other explanation. So there is a king to come, but it can't be Yeshua. The Shiloh is to come and the nations are, will be gathered to him, but they don't have any kind of a, a, a complete answer on what it may be, but we just definitely know it's not, uh, uh, not Yeshua. He doesn't take the New Testament as authoritative. That's him. Brother, I understand what you're saying. And, yes, what you hear being said tonight is spirit of Antichrist. But, yet, it is not on me to say that because this brother don't believe that somehow he's con condemned uh, by God. I don't have that power. That's between him and Yah. But I will say this. If Brother Neza really believes and just sees nothing, he's mind, his mind not convinced, then who are we to say that he should, uh, he should agree just because we believe? All right, Rabbi Ash, you can reply, brother. You can reply. Mm -hmm. Rabbi. First of all, I never said the Messiah is coming in 2,000 years from the destruction of the temple or from the exile of Israel. It could be 3,000, 4,000, 8,000 years till we repent. And the reason it cannot be Jesus is because he's dead. And he never fulfilled any of the prophecies that are exhaustive and exclusive. In other words, he fulfilled prophecies that any of us could have supposedly fulfilled. Now, how can he be the king we're waiting for when he died 2,000 years ago? And he even lied about his coming. He said that this generation shall not pass away till they see the Son of Man. There's a major disconnect here. And then the brother is speaking very confidently, but I mean, it's completely not understanding what I'm trying to say here. I believe in Torah. Everything I believe has to be justified in Torah. I'm not walking around and taking one verse and saying that this is talking about Muhammad and this is talking about Joseph Smith, because if I did, I'd be lying, because I don't know. The only thing I do know is that I have to keep Torah, because that's what God commanded me to do. 
Does it say anywhere in Torah that some king's going to come, die, and then come back 2,000 years later? Not at all. But for some reason, this has been solidified in their minds already. And it's really like pulling teeth. It's so ingrained that it must be Yeshua. Why can God be true and every man a liar? Why can we just stand on the word of God and try to execute the commandments the best way we could? And if we do that, why would a good God push us away and say, oh, no, that little esoteric group that you didn't want to join? Well, they had the answer, even though it appears nowhere in Torah. Of course, in Genesis, when it talks about Judah, it's talking about future kings to come. But am I going to say this is talking about some man who appeared a few thousand years later, died, didn't fulfill any of the exhaustive and exclusive prophecies, and I'm supposed to build my faith on this and my eternity? That's adding to the Torah. That's changing the Torah. The only thing the Torah told me to do was to keep the commands within it, and I would be blessed. Now, if Brother Ben Israel is teaching something different, he's a false prophet. All right, our brother Yosef. By the way, brother Yosef is going to be on the show in two weeks. Yeah, my brother, uh, did, they, uh, did they answer your question? Any last words you want to say? I'll let the people know how old you are. <laughs> uh, I'm 13. Yeah, 13 years old, man. He's a very wise brother, so we're going to have him on the show in uh, two weeks. But anything you want to say? Any last words you want to say before we move on to the next person? Oh, uh, no, that's all I want to say. I appreciate your call, brother. Appreciate your call. Uh, let's go to the next person, uh, 770-648. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, shalom, a water swordsman. What I want to say is this. This is why the New Testament is relevant, because Christ came, Yahweh Shah came, and he walked and he spoke. And, he, and this is the main point, why the New Testament is relevant. This is our Second Timothy 2, verse 7. Consider what I say. And the Lord give thee understanding in all things. And I want to read this too. This is St. John seven thirty two. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. This is what Moses couldn't do. He couldn't give understanding on what happens in the future. Like if you read about the seals that's in Revelation, Christ gave that. The prophets used to speak. He says prophets. He tell you that he, Moses spoke of him in Deuteronomy eighteen eighteen. Okay, Moses didn't have that bread from heaven that he gave understanding on death, what happened after death, the, set, the seals, how this earth is going to be judged, what happened with Adam's transgress, transgression. And he also gave understanding on the fourth that caused men to sin, which was Satan. When you read uh, Matthew's the fourth chapter, he brought that out. Moses didn't bring these things out. That's why the New Testament is relevant, because he brought understandings that Moses could have not brung because he don't know he wasn't in the heavenly realm. That's why it's relevant. And he was fulfilling everything that was written of him. I don't know why the, why this guy don't see that. That's all I want to say. Shalom. I appreciate your call. Um, Zadok Benesha, you want to reply? Well, at the end of the day, I mean, I understand exactly what the brother who just called, uh, who called in said. Um, and I, I say shalom to him as well. At the end of the day, this brother simply doesn't believe he's from a sect um, of the people who he, he would have been there saying, stone him, stone him. So as he says, I'm a false prophet, what I'm going to say is, is that his whole application as, uh, 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 as understanding Torah is false. For instance, he claims to be a, a, a great understander of the Torah, but then he turns around and then he quotes New Testament things as if he understands those things. Yes, Yeshua said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, if you look up the word that's used there in the Greek for fulfilled, the word actually means until these things begin to come into being. So he was totally right. That generation saw all that stuff Yeshua was talking about, and that generation did not pass with all that stuff starting to happen. At the end of the day, Brother Meza doesn't believe the New Testament, so that's why I didn't read a whole bunch of New Testament. If you go back and listen to this carefully, uh, the brother who called it anyone else, I didn't read a lot of New Testament because I wanted to ask him questions dealing with what is written and what he accepts, and he danced around it. He said they don't know who Shiloh is. That's what he said, but after the break, now all of a sudden it's established who it is. He's telling you who his particular group believes it is, and I have to accept. That's who y'all believe it is. Y'all believe it's many kings in Judah? No. It says 
unto him shall the assembling of the people be, until Shiloh come and unto him, not unto them. So that's just one of the things, and if he don't accept this Yeshua, I'm not here tonight to make him uh, believe it, but we're just here to witness. That's it. All right, Rabbi Asher, you can reply. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. It's kind of weird that a Jew has to educate a Christian on Christian scripture. But the verse actually says, this generation will be on this earth until Christ returns in the clouds of glory and all is fulfilled. So for some reason, he left out clouds of glory in that prophecy, which was a false prophecy. And I have to mention something that the brother said, and I sort of let go last uh, rebuttal, but I can't let it go now. He said, why is it okay for me to believe what the Torah says in faith and not okay for him to believe what the New Testament says in faith? I thought we both believe in the Torah, and only one of us believes in the New Testament. And it's not the Torah that's under scrutiny tonight, but the New Testament. So he is elevating the New Testament over Torah. One greater than Abraham is here, is what the New Testament says. That's a pretty audacious statement. Even the brother who just called said that the New Testament oversees Torah because Moses didn't have this, and Moses didn't have that. But Jesus had it. Why? Because the New Testament said so. And not just the New Testament said so, but the council of Nicaea decided so. So I want you guys to really pay attention to what's going on here. You have a brother trying to keep Torah, trying to uphold what we all believe in, and then you have a text that crept in a few thousand years later, screaming, validate me. And then you have a book called the Quran, and then the Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, countless works compounding on each other trying to take the glory away from God. <laughs> it's, it's just a bit of an audacious statement for someone to say, oh, well, I just teach what the Torah teaches, and then come and quote the book of Revelations and claim that Jesus is greater than Moses. Well, like the New Testament says, that he's greater than Abraham, that he knew something they didn't. So it shows that Jesus is the real God for them and not the God of the Tanakh. And that's my response. All right. All right, we got a lot of callers here with a lot of questions. Let's go to the people. Once again, if you have any questions, the number is 646-716-7320. That's 646-716-7320. All you got to do is press the number one, and, of course, I'll add you into the conversation. Let's go to the next person here, uh, 336-480. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a comment, brother. Um, first of all, I would like to say uh, peace be unto you. And... Um, I would like to say um, that it's the people. It's not the books. It's the people. It's not the books at all. Um, For one coincide with the other and the other coincide with the one. It's not the books. It's the people. Uh, The thing about it is, is that we, all of us, know that the Old Testament prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. The New Testament is valid proof that 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 prophecy of the Messiah to come came, came. The anointed one, God, came on the earth, not just at that time in the, in the New Testament, but the anointed one of God also always um, showed his face in the Old Testament as well. Uh, especially um, in David, when David made a point, he said, um, Lord, I know my flesh is going to rot and decay, and I know my flesh is going to see corruption, but let not your holy one see corruption. And the New Testament testified, and it said that, that that holy one that was in David, that David was referring to, was the Christ, the anointed one of God. So, you see, the Christ was even in the Old Testament. It didn't have the name Christ because the word Christ uh, is an old English name that has been translated from the, the Greek language, which it was in the Greek called the Christo. And then when it was in the Hebrew, it was called the Logo. So, so we're talking about a people and we're talking about a language and we're talking about a nature. I mean, not a nature, but we're talking about a nation. You see what I'm saying? The people gather together under one language. Now, being that we gather together under one language and we call that holy one, that holy thing today, Christ in us, that's the same thing that David saw in his day. He saw the Christ in him. The same thing that God made a promise to Abraham. He said, he said, to thy seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. 
And he said, uh, he said, according to thy seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And he told Abraham, he said, Abraham, look out at the stars and count the stars. And Abraham said, I can't count them. And, and the Lord said to Abraham, he said, well, Abraham, so shall thy seed be. And he was saying that not, not uh, the seed with the S on it. He said, so shall thy seed be, that Christ shall be as numerous as the stars. You see what I'm saying? So now what we're dealing with, we're dealing with a people who have, who have uh, been divided as a people. Now they believe, now some of them, they believe in the old school and want to stay with the old school. Some believe the new school. Yeah, I'm sorry, my brother. We have a uh, time limit on the calls, but I really appreciate your call and your comments. Let's go to Zadok Benizio. Zadok Benizio, you can reply. Well, I mean, I understand what the elder is saying, and yes, uh, Shades of the Messiah, which this brother calls foreshadowed. And notice how at the beginning I established what the word esoteric means because he continuously, he probably has said that word about 40 times. So we know that this is a principle that is established in the understanding of where, you know, the brother comes from. And once again, the word esoteric means not publicly disclosed, intended for or understood by a small group. So things that he called esoteric, the word carries the idea of somebody understanding what this stuff means. He himself admitted that in Genesis 49, they have established that no one really knows the answer. But brothers and sisters, we believe through what has been established in the writings of the Old Testament as, I'm sorry, New Testament, as witness to some of the things prophesied esoterically, that they have been revealed in the person of Yeshua. He says, oh, he says, one better than Abraham is here, or one greater than Moses. Didn't David say in Psalm 119 that he understood more than the ancients? So David can say he understood more than Abraham. He didn't have to name them, but who are the ancients before him that he understood more than because he kept the creator's precepts. Brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, we see the person of Messiah established, okay? I did not go to Genesis 49. I didn't go to Isaiah uh, and none of those to try and say that the New Testament is better than the Old Testament. I read Genesis 49 to establish that there is a Messiah spoken of. He agrees. He just don't accept it's Yeshua. So he said, oh, it just got to be Jesus. But to them, it just got to not be. And so that's where we differ. To them, it just can't be him even though one is to come. That's just all I got to say on that. Hmm. Right, There's uh, no uh, notion Asher. of one that is to come in Judaism. There are many messiahs. And anyone familiar with that term, anointed, knows that every king of Israel, like I said, was a messiah, and every high priest was a messiah, and in some cases, a few prophets. Now, what these individuals are doing, they're basically shooting an arrow, which is Jesus, and painting the whole Bible. And to even say that David would have had the audacity to say that he knew more about Torah, about God, than Moses, shows that he doesn't understand Scripture. And he keeps on trying to explain these English definitions, esoteric. Fine, call it secret. In Deuteronomy 29.29, I'm going to read you what it says in the Hebrew of that verse. Continually quote the secret things. It says, Hani sarot la eloheinu, the secret things. Secret things belong to God. Brothers and sisters, if you can't agree that we don't know what happened to Enoch when God took him, if you cannot admit that's a secret thing, then perhaps you have to go back to Bible school. Then he says, What's revealed to us is for us and our children forever. That's it. It's a secret thing. It's what's not clear. But this notion... Of, that esoteric means that there's a small group who does know, and what a coincidence, that's his group. But it really doesn't help the argument at hand that is the New Testament relevant. A book, like I said, was compiled by the Catholic Church. A book that there are so many variants that really explain where we have so many denominations today. Why is this irrelevant? Because it claims to supersede Torah. Take King David, for example, the greatest poet we have in Tanakh. What does he countlessly speak about? Some Messiah or the law of God? He says in Psalm chapter 1, he who meditates on this law day and night will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He says later that thy word, his Torah, 
is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Torah, Torah, Torah. That's what it's reiterated countless times. These individuals have a very sick fascination with some Messiah, which any historian could have predicted they would end up worshiping as God and taking his glory away when he tells us in Isaiah that he shares his glory with no one. Of course, they have a problem with that verse. Oh, it's because it's three, and the three make up one. The reason the New Testament is irrelevant is because it hurts more than it helps. really wish that people would stick to trying to validate the New Testament with the Torah than trying to validate the Torah with the New Testament. And that's my response. All right, once again, you're listening to Debate Talk View Radio. If you have any questions, the number is 646-716-7320. Let your voice be heard. Feel free to ask your questions or your comments. All you got to do is press the number one. And, of course, I'll add to the conversation. We have a few more questions in the queue, a few more questions. So we're going to go to the people right about now. Let's see what they got to say. Uh, 314-680. You're live on Debate Talk View. 314-680. Hey, what's going on, brothers? Hey, what's going on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, brother. Hello? Hey, yeah, um... Um, brother, uh, you guys, uh, I, both of y'all, I, I heard one of the guys, um, the guy who's uh, orthodox, I heard you on um, on YouTube. You know, you, you're a good brother. You know, you seem like you're uh, knowledgeable in a lot of things. But uh, you um, you make, you. I, I mean, if I was a person, I couldn't really come to you and ask you or come to, come to uh, the Torah or learn the ways of the Torah by you because it's like you skipping over something. It's like you got... The Almighty have us offering all these uh, bloody goats and calves and lambs and stuff. And behind that is like, why did he initiate that? You have no answer to that. You don't have no answer to why uh, it was initiated in the garden, uh, uh, when they got out of the garden, why Abel, uh, Cain and Abel did it. You can't really answer none of that. And, 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 and that, that would right there would pause me and say, okay, what is the point behind this? What is this shadow? Or you can't really answer uh, the death of what, what? Matter of fact, can I ask you, what is death? Death? Hello? Yeah, what is death? Yes. Can you explain that to me? Death is the opposite of life. And see, like, that answer what you just got through saying right there. Like, it just let me know. You don't even really know what death is. Death is separation from God or separation from your body or separation of, of the spirit and the, uh, of the spirit from your, your body. That's what death is. Like, you answer stuff like that. It's like, do you even – death is something also supernatural. It's something that ha- happened that we was made to be eternal, but it took a supernatural act to separate us from the almighty God. And the stuff that you said, you have no answer. You can't even answer for that. It's like you beating around the bush. But I yield on that on that note. Uh, I appreciate your call. That yeah, Rabbi Asher, you can reply. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Torah and Parashat Re'eh says choose life over death. So in that scenario, death is living a life without Torah. Now, the brother could quote the New Testament as much as he wants, which is what many people are doing here today. I mean, they're hiding behind the words of Paul like it has any authority. Why not quote the Torah? What does the Torah want us to believe? It's funny. People want answers. But I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, if you find a teacher who claims to have every answer to every secret portion of the Torah, he's lying. If it's there, believe it. If it's not, don't speculate. Do what the Almighty told you to do. He never told you to seek out some Messiah. He told you to keep his commandments. That's it. What's so hard? Why do we need a New Testament? Why do we need a second coming? Why do we need a Redeemer apart from God? That's, that's, and every call is pretty much just reiterating the other one. People who have a preconceived notion and are wondering why Jews don't see it. Don't forget, the Torah came before the New Testament. The New Testament and its many variants actually appeared pretty late on the scene. Some books even written over 100 years after the death of Jesus. But what we can all agree on is that the only revelation that the Almighty gave humanity was the five books of Moses. And that's it. As a matter of fact, most people don't even know who compiled the same books that you're quoting and trying to tell us Jews it really means or what it's really trying to say. When we compiled them, we were the ones who were telling you these are good for edification but not to override Torah. Of course, we have this big gap between the Jewish world and the non-Jewish world that I'm trying to seal up tonight that has kept 
Christians from focusing on our only authority, which is the five books of Moses. And the Talmud clearly states that even during the destruction of the Second Temple, they weren't clear on what books were actually included in what people call the Old Testament today. They argued about Sefer Yeheskel, Shira Shirim, Kohelet, which is Ezekiel, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. You're using books that we compiled, that we put together, and you're telling us what it means? All right, uh, hold on, Rabbi Ash. I gotta bring the Doc Ben Israel in because we got more, many more callers here. Uh, so, Doc Ben Israel, you can go ahead with your, your, your reply. Go ahead. See, now the truth has come to light. The brother, who is this we? You live in Miami, homie. We? See, now it's going past what you claimed earlier about it's not about ethnicity, it's not about bloodline, but it's about those from among the nations who will praise God and keep Torah, they really are Jews. So who is this we? See, now you're trying to go somewhere that you shouldn't, and you're walking on dangerous ground, at least in this circle. Why? Because, my brother, simply, most of the people you're talking to tonight are definitely more likely than the people in Israel you spent time with, the actual flesh and blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those Irish, those Germans, those British, those European Ashkenazis who run Israel and who run Brooklyn, New York, who run the, 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 uh, uh, the, the rabbinic councils of today, that's not the we. Is that, the, is that who you refer to as we? My people are the only ones who fit the bill of the curses in Torah. Your people run international banking systems. Your people run Hollywood. Your people run industries that even Adolf Hitler was afraid of them. Henry Ford was afraid of the people you referred to, and you yourself said that you are of Colombian descent, I believe. So more than likely, when you say we, you're not referring to those Europeans from the 13th and the 12th and 11th centuries, I hope. But what about the Septuagint? The Septuagint has the books in a slightly different order, but yet we know that these books were translated by the 70 uh, uh, Hebrew Israelite elders, five from each tribe, not just Jewish or Jews, but from each tribe in Israel that went to Alexandria and translated. He's talking about this free. I'm going I'm to I'm make this one statement, Sal, and then uh, go to the next call. I just want to read this because he keeps quoting this Deuteronomy 29. This Deuteronomy 29 says this in verse 28. The hidden sins are for Hashem. I'm reading out of his Tanakh. Our God, but the revealed sins are for us and our children forever to carry out the words of this Torah. Now, the understanding is this. There were sins committed in the dark that the people would possibly never find out. So those hidden things, brothers and sisters, Yahweh is going to deal with them. Like he said, if a man do that and if a man do this, I will answer that man to his face. I will cut him off from among his people. But brothers and sisters, there were other sins that if some things were done openly and found out, the Lord left it in the hands of Israel forever to execute judgment and openly tell you that you're breaking Torah. As far as the esoteric things, they are only hidden to him. What they choose to say is hidden is hidden, and other things they claim to openly understand. Well, just say you don't understand some things and humble yourself and say, hey, brother, I don't agree with you, but we don't understand some things. But anything we say about Yeshua is totally foreign and kicked out the window, but everything belongs in the hands of you guys. Come on, some we, we translated the book. Man, the people you follow ain't had nothing to do with the order of the books. Natural-born Israelites had something to do with that. And I only went there because you done got a little bit beside yourself. Let's humble ourselves and come back down. All right, once again, you're listening to Debate Talk Free Radio. The title of this debate is The New Testament Relevant. Uh, we actually have 36 more minutes left on the air. Uh, this segment particularly is 35 minutes. What I'm going to do, I'm going to extend this segment to get more questions for the people. I see there's a lot of questions for the people, so I'm going to extend this particular segment, and then after this, we're going to go into the final statements. 
So uh, once again, if you have any questions or comments, the number is 646-716-7320. Let's go to the people. Let's see what they got to say. Uh, 513-410. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Any questions or comments? Well, actually, brother, yeah, I've got a comment. I appreciate you letting me in. Shalom to Brother Zadok. And I want to say a couple of things, man. I actually want to start off with dealing with Hanukkah and the reference to it in John 10, 22 in the New Testament, the Feast of Dedication, you know, Hanukkah. And it's not listed in the Old Testament. But that, I mean, this brother didn't open up a whole can of worms. And that can is dealing with the authenticity of Jewish people. And I'm glad this, 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 this guy, um, the rabbi, is on here. Because he did make possessive claims dealing with, um, we wrote this book, we done this, we did that. But you love uh, quote, quoting the, the Torah, the Old Testament. We can deal with different precepts in that scripture, like the brother brought out Deuteronomy 28, like, you know, um, different scriptures in Numbers chapter 12 dealing with Moses' hand being turned to different colors. I mean, there's several different precepts. Where do you stand with those things as far as, dealing with your, uh, you know, the, the, the peoples who you claim to be Jews or Jewish in the Torah. How do you relate these to, to those people in Israel today? I think I'm completely being misquoted here. The only distinction I made was in education and in terms of the Sanhedrin. Before the temple was destroyed, they were sitting all the way here from Deuteronomy chapter 18 and all the many portions that the Almighty commands Moses to establish a court to decide these legal issues. Now, the brother wanted to make it into some sort of racial thing. Since when did I ever claim that a secular Jew or someone who claims to be a Jew who doesn't believe in Torah, since when did I ever claim that I consider them Jewish? Now, the truth is, the vast majority of people listening to this show now didn't know they were always Jewish. We have a tradition, a written tradition, passed down. We have been keeping Torah even when it wasn't popular to do so. And I'm not talking about the founders of Israel or the heads of the bank. I'm talking about people who keep Torah, no matter what color they are, no matter what part of the world they happen to be, for someone to come up against me, when everyone knows that the basis of my ministry has no color, but it's based on knowledge and on what we know and what you don't know. And by the simple fact that the brothers get a claim that the whole Septuagint included all the books of Tanakh show that he does not know history. The Septuagint only included the five books of Moses, and it was written at a time that the ten lost tribes did not exist anymore. So the notion that there were five men from every tribe, I mean, I'm not really sure where he's getting his history from, but I just have to educate yeah, him. Uh, yeah, 513, you still on? Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, I actually, um, I mean, we, we can deal with, all right, I guess he uh, got cut off. All right, uh, the document is you can go ahead. You can reply. Well, at the end of the day, if that's not what you were implying, brother, then I apologize. But when he, when you say we, we did this, we did that, I think that there's a miscalculation on the part of those who consider themselves to be Jewish. Because at the end of the day, we know that even the Hebrew that spoke in the day only came into play at a certain time to, when those in Europe wanted to try and learn Hebrew and bring it back as an everyday language of the quote-unquote Jewish people. But what we're referring to now is the idea of a whole history and a whole promise and a whole uh, understanding that the Creator has written in His Word as far as his people. For instance, we know that coming from the Babylonian captivity, that it had to be shown who you were according to bloodline. Even the book of Ezekiel establishes that the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes, now you, now the way y'all say Jewish, you can't say anyone can be a Reubenite, anyone can be a Levite, anyone can be a Danite, an Asherite. We are talking about the 12 tribes, and in the book of Ezekiel, there are a flesh and blood remnant from the actual descendancy who will also do the righteousness of Yah, and they will inherit the land. And the strangers who want to sojourn in the land among them shall be given an inheritance with them among the tribe which they choose to dwell among. So the flesh and blood descendants coming back to the realization of who they are and keeping his laws is as important. So when you say we, it kind of struck a chord, but you, you, you kind of cleaned it up, so if that's not what you were saying, cool. But as the brother who just called in was saying, at the end of the day, there are many things dealing with the Torah that explain.
blame not only people who are prophesied and converted to Torah have an inheritance, but the whole 12 tribes and the term Jewish, if you will, is it something, it, 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 it could be a spiritual term, if you will, but you can't spiritualize a Nazarite. You can't spiritualize an Ephraimite or a Manassite. Those are flesh and blood children who are being woken up today, of which I believe I and many others are a part of, brother. So that is another part that has to be understood, that when you say that term, we did this, we gave you this, we gave you that, that Sanhedrin you speak of, that, I'm sorry, that Sanhedrin you speak of was made up of nothing but flesh and blood Israelites. There were no people of another ethnicity in that Sanhedrin, unless they were Edomites who were converted. So you might have a leg to stand on there. But uh, barbarians from Europe and all that, which a lot of people who are Jewish today uh, uh, are definitely can be proven to come from, they had no part uh, in establishing the validity or the non-validity of anything. All right. All right, I'm going to take a few more calls before we go into the final statements. Just take a few more. So once again, if you have any questions or comments, the number is 646-716-7320. Definitely, uh, that's my favorite part of the show, hearing from the people. So this is your time to let your voice be heard. Once again, the number is 646-716-7320. The title of this debate is the New Testament Relevance. Is the New Testament relevant? Do you, do you agree? Do you disagree? Feel free to call in. Let's go to the next person here. 678-973. You're live on Debate Talk for you. Any questions or comments? 678 Yeah, I can hear you, brother. Yeah, yeah. I have, a, I have a statement to make, then I have a scripture to back it up, right? Uh, 70 AD, there was a, a historical event happening in 70 AD when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem, and they have a heart called the Heart of Titus, as documented, uh, as proof that event happened. So there's a statement that how shall Jesus Christ make in the New Testament concerning that event. I'm going to read this. It's in Luke 21 and 20. And then you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. Then know the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountain, and let them which are in the midst of, of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein. For these shall be the days of vengeance, that all things which is written is fulfilled. And when you read down into the 24th verse, it said, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and it shall be led captive in all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, who are living over there right now in Israel, time of the Gentiles to be fulfilled. That's all about the second coming of Christ. So this are, these, are, these are historical events that I mean 70 AD. And uh, there was a temple over there called the Wailing Wall. That's a remnant of the temple that was destroyed in 70 AD. So this statement, well, how was I made, Jesus Christ made, that was fulfillment of 70 AD prophecy. And there's a lot of historical record in that. And uh, when you go back to, in, uh, uh, I think, St. John 5, uh, the sixth chapter, Christ speak about Moses. He said, if you don't believe in Moses, how can you believe in in, in me, Moses wrote about me. Then when you read in, uh, I think it's Zechariah, the 14th chapter, it tells you that Christ's feet are going to land on Mount Olives in his second coming. Because they, that's when he leaves uh, his first coming, when he went back to the Father. So Luke, the 21st chapter, fulfilled the prophecy of 70 AD, and that proves that Christ exists. And the Roman calendar records the birth of Christ. That's why I say AD. So to rebuttal to rebel what the rabbis say, you need to explain this to me. Luke 21, 20 to verse 24. You need to explain that to me. Now that's talking about Sentia AD. And you know about Sentia AD. Everyone knows about Sentia AD. That's, that's a historical fact that uh, that prophet was fulfilled in Sentia AD 40 years after Christ went back to the Father. That's all I have to say. I appreciate your call, brother. Uh, go ahead, Rabbi Asher, you can reply. It's not fair to use the text in question, the New Testament, to try to justify itself. Or use the historical documents of the church fathers to say, hey, this means that we can include or even elevate the New Testament to the level of Torah. 
I said there was really no historical evidence for Jesus. I believe Jesus existed. I don't believe he, was, that he rose from the dead. I mean, he may have been killed. Thousands of Jews were killed and crucified. But I'm not really sure like, what his point is in terms of trying to use New Testament to validate New Testament. Okay. Uh, let's go to the Dr. Nigel. Guys, it up. Well, I understood the brother. He had a nice accent there. I don't know if he was from the islands or from uh, calling from Africa, but uh, he had a beautiful accent there. And I, I think I caught the gist of what he was trying to get at. And what he was saying was, was that uh, Yeshua, as a prophet, told the people, and it is witnessed in uh, Mark chapter 13, Matthew chapter 24, and Luke chapter 21, that Jesus gave a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. And he talked about the abomination of desolation being placed. And in Luke 21, he called it when armies come past Jerusalem. See that those of you who are inside, out of the city, when the armies come nigh to Jerusalem. For then these be the days of vengeance to execute the things, uh, 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 to, to fulfill all the things written. As far as all the things concerning the sin of the people and the creator uh, 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 destroying them and putting them out the land. And so then he says, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden under foot of the nations. And so this day you have every nation under the sun over in Jerusalem claiming it. You have the sons of Ishmael fighting the sons of Ashkenaz and Edom over rights to the land. And you have uh, 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 some of the flesh and blood descendants of Israel coming back like the Limba, like the Falasha, like some of the black Hebrew tribes uh, uh, who, who claim to descend from Asher and Dan coming out of India, along with some of their lighter-skinned brothers uh, from the different parts of the earth who are there. You have America there. You have Britain there. You have the nations of the earth trotting Jerusalem underfoot now until their time is up from ruling over the earth. They will be in Jerusalem with control of it right now. And so, as Brother Meza said in our pre-debate, that Israel, the country called Israel right now, is not really built on religion. It is a secular country. And he can admit that many people over there are of European descent. They are from many nations, and the nations are over there doing what's happening. But 70 A.D., what happened in 70, and what he called the, uh, the Ark of Titus or the Stele of Titus, the thing that Titus had built in commemoration of him sacking Jerusalem, taking the things from the temple back to Rome, and actually having uh, Israelites in chains, that that is a archaeological thing that proves that Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans. And what the elder was pointing out was that Jesus prophesied of his, that in his day, and it happened 40 years later. It don't tell you, actually, you don't read nowhere in the New Testament where, when Jerusalem was destroyed, but the prophecy that it would be destroyed. It's talked about in the New Testament. Jesus gave it, and it came to pass. A great prophet spoke, and his truth has been revealed. That's all. That's all the elder was saying. All right, so once again, I'm going to take a few more questions before we go into the final statement. Just a few more questions. The number is 646-716-7320. Now, for those people that just joined in not too long ago, uh, you can always go to the archives and uh, check out the show. The show is recorded, so let's go to the website, www.blogtalkradio.com slash debate talk for you. And let me, know, let me know what you thought about this debate. Send me an email at debate talk for you at gmail.com. Once again, I'm going to take a few more callers before we go into the final statement. Let's go to the people. Uh, let's see, 775338. They will have more debate talk for you. Any questions or comments? 775338. They will have more debate talk for you. All right, going once, going on twice. All right, we got to move on to the next person. Uh, 513410. You'll have more debate talk for you. Any questions or comments? Okay, my bad, brothers. I got cut off a while back. I just had one more quick question for for the uh, for the other brother on the phone. On Deuteronomy 18 and 18, who do who do Jewish people refer that to? Who did who did it? Who do they say that that's referring to? Um, according to you all's theology, Joshua. Joshua. Is there any kind of scripture mm -hmm. that's going to prove that point? Or absolutely. Wait, if you follow the whole narrative through the book of Joshua, he's the one that Moses chooses, and the Almighty puts his words in his mouth. I mean, it's only a clear continuation of the actual literal text. I mean, the notion that we're claiming that some sort of 
mystical figure is going to come and, and, and even claim to do what Jesus is doing, add to the text and modify our religion is really absurd. According to the Peshat, according to the literal meaning of the story, in continuation to Moses was Joshua. Okay, um, one last quick question. I, I didn't get, I got my phone got cut off, so I didn't get to hear your reply to that Deuteronomy 28, 45, and 46. Uh, I have to look that up. Hold on. I didn't even hear that question asked. Yeah, I'm sorry. I can read it for you real quick if you'd like. As a matter of fact, just for time's sake, I'll do that. Deuteronomy 28, 45, it says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake thee till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord mm-hmm. thy God to keep his commandments and his statutes which commandeth thee. And they, talking, you know, speaking of the curses, shall be upon thee for a sign and for a wonder and upon thy seed forever. If I'm looking at that, the verse 46, all these curses listed in this scripture should be upon the children of Israel forever as a sign and a wonder. And, of course, you know, poverty is one of these things, low economic position, low financial position, education, housing, all these things are listed in this uh, 28th chapter of Deuteronomy, among other things, slavery in verse 68, will, these people will be sold into slavery as bondmen and bondwomen, um, on ships. Now, my question was, how do Jewish people fit these prophecies, and especially verse 46, as the brothers that I pointed out, the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, people who own the financial structure of this earth today, um, the banking families are all Jewish. The people who instituted, who own the slave trade, the trans- transatlantic slave trade, like Aaron Lopez, they finance slavery. How could these curses apply to them? At the same time, they're the ones perpetuating the curses on another people. What's, what's your response? These Rockefellers aren't Jewish. Jewish, or a member of the covenant in the Torah, even in the prophets, only signifies someone who fears God and keeps commandments. So if you open any history book and look at the history of the Jewish people, even from the destruction of the second temple, you didn't even have to go to the first temple. They were sold into slavery. Every curse applies to them. I have a whole video online, it's 45 minutes long, and I go through this whole chapter, 28, verse by verse, and show how this does not fit the African. And for some reason, Brother Ben Yisrael's true colors are coming out, making these statements that because someone happens to be of African descent, they are automatically Israel. And, I mean, this should be a show in itself. But if you just go on YouTube and type in, the original Hebrews were not black, you'll get four of my videos dismembering these really <laughs> audacious claims that the scriptures in some way teach that the Hebrews were exclusively black. Now, I'm not teaching a racial message here. If you keep Torah, you're a member of Israel. Anyone familiar with the Exodus narrative knows that when Israel left Egypt, they left with a mixed multitude. What happened to that multitude? They were absorbed into the tribes. There's no such thing as being pure or impure, with the notion that by definition, he's going to exclude any one from European descent, and I am not from European descent, but if he's going to exclude people because of race, then he's the hater. He's the one causing division. But to answer your question, Israel has embodied these curses since their inception, since they failed to keep Torah, and only because like, for the last 80 years, for the last 90 years in America, Jews have prospered does not mean that they didn't embody these curses in Europe. In Sephardic countries, I mean, for some reason, black Hebrews only assume that those who claim to be Jewish today descend from Europe. But if they go to Israel and they meet Jews from Iraq, from Morocco, from all over the world, I think they change their opinion and really drop some of the racism, that it's really reverse racism. I mean, I'm not trying to justify what anyone who claims to be Jewish today does in the name of Judaism if it's not based on the words of Torah. But to claim that every secular Jew is a Jew that really falls in line with their theology that even every African American who doesn't know is a Hebrew is a Hebrew. But when the Torah that reminds us countless times that if we don't keep the commands from the Torah, we will be cut off from our people. Cut off, what does that mean? Does that mean once a Jew, always a Jew? Or does that mean that if the Rothschild claims to be a Hebrew, when he doesn't know the first tenets of Judaism, he's still Jewish? Absolutely not. A broken spirit and a contrite heart has always been the standard. And that's my response. All right. We wind it down actually to the last uh, 14 minutes of the show on the air. So definitely we're going to go into the overtime part of the show. So for those people that's listening via online, you'll have to call in. Once the show is over, you're going to have to call in uh, 
646-716-7320 to hear the rest of the show over the phone because we're going to be off in the next 14 minutes live on the air on the Internet. So once again, if you want to hear the final statements, which we're going to go into that in a few minutes, the number is 646-716-7320. I'll limit it to Doc Van Israel reply, and then I'm going to take maybe one or two more callers, and then we're going to go into the final statement. Guys, Doc. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, he said my true colors are coming out. Well, I think his came out. He walked it back, and, you know, uh, I, uh, I thought he was saying one thing. He claimed he wasn't, and I apologized to him uh, because – it's clear that not only I, but some others took what he was saying a certain way as well. Now, the one thing about it is this. It's not that I'm, in my heart or in my understanding, can exclude anyone. But what happens is is the idea that if you are a flesh and blood descendant of the 12 tribes of Jacob, that somehow it has no standing. Well, the one thing is this, is that there are – many places in the Torah that we can read and show that the Creator has a desire that the flesh and blood descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob get themselves together, not just those from any nation who want to serve the Lord. He accepts them, but his first worry is Israel, the actual nation. And when it comes to the idea and the concept that uh, 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 people preach that only uh, 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 this black exclusivity skin color thing to the Israelites, I said nothing about that. I said that my people fit the curses exactly. Now, if you're going to go other places and find the curses fitting others and they want to claim uh, 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 to be descendants of the 12 tribes, then great. I have nothing to do with that. What I'm saying is is that in regardless of this idea, this allegory, for instance, you have Muslims from Morocco, from Iraq, and Spain, just as you have people who are called Jews. But that don't mean that they are actually Ishmaelites. They are Muslims. So Jew is referring to the idea of someone praising God, but Judah actually has physical flesh and blood children, and even if he don't serve the Lord, he's still Judah. He's uh, uh, Eli's sons, Eli who brought up Samuel. His sons were wicked. They were still Levi. So there is importance in knowing and recognizing the possibilities of who the flesh and blood descendants are, and according to the curses and conditions in the, upon the people in every generation, as, they, as it says in Leviticus, as they pine away in iniquity in their captor's land, and the land of their captivity will eat them up. That's happening to my people. That's how we know a lot of us are flesh and blood descendants as well. Now, I'm not saying that's going to get me uh, across the street on a nickel. But what I'm saying is I'm just stating a matter of fact. The curses follow the nation for signs. Look and see who these signs follow, and you will be able to find the flesh and blood children of Israel. That was really just a statement on that regard. Now, as far as tonight's debate, is the New Testament relevant? Jesus, the prophet, spoken of in Deuteronomy, he says it's Joshua. But he didn't say that earlier. When I asked him who that was in Deuteronomy uh, uh, chapter 18, he said that it was someone to come, but it wasn't Yehoshua. He didn't say it was Joshua then, but he says it now. Cool. Earlier I asked him who was in Genesis uh, 49. He said that they don't agree on who it is. And brothers and sisters, he also will tell you that many of the things that he's saying here today Many of the more accepted and well-known Orthodox Jewish sects don't accept the stance that this sect believes in. So there are many differences on where this thing goes. But as far as Israel, yes, the God is not a respecter of persons. You can come unto the commonwealth of Israel. But as it says in Romans 11, don't let those who have been grafted in believe that somehow the natural branches are lost. No, they can be grafted back into their own tree, and that's really what we're referring to in stating our claim to uh, Israel. All right, once again, we're definitely going to go into the overtime part of this debate. 
So for those of you that's online, make sure you call in by dialing the number 646-716-7320 to hear the final statements. We're going to go into the final statements pretty soon. I'm going to take one or two more callers, but then we're going to go into the final statements. Uh, what I asked you, what I'm going to do right now is, being that we, uh, you know, I'm ready for time. Anybody that has any comments, I'm going to take only people that have comments. Quick comments, you can, uh, you know, call in and press the number one because uh, we don't have any time really for any questions right now because we want to try, try to get to the final statements. So if you have a comment, the number is 646-716-7320. And those of you that already asked questions, do me a favor, press the number one, and that will take you off the switchboard and bring other people further up on the switchboard. So if you already asked a question, you can uh, press the number one again, and that will take you off the switchboard and bring other people on the switchboard. Once again, if you have a quick comment, the number is 646-716-7320. I'm trying to get as much people as possible. So let's go to the next person. Once again, any comments here? Let's see, 775-338. You're live on the Bay Talk for you, 775-338. Do you have any uh, comments? 775? All right, got to go to the next person. Uh, 513-628, quick comments. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. Strong, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, brother. No. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, this is uh, Yashua with Israel now. Um, just wanted to make a quick comment. I was going to put it in the question form, but I'm going to just make a comment. Like you said, um, I'm going to go right back to Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18 because Asher said that it was Joshua from the Old Testament, so I'm going to quickly prove that it's not. So if you read it, it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brothers, like unto thee. I will put my words in his mouth he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. So it clearly says to Moses that the Most High will raise up a prophet like him, like Moses. So now all we have to do is stay in the same book and go to chapter 34 and look at verse number 7 through 9. Look what it says. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor was his natural um, force abated Moab um, Okay verse 8 And the children of Israel wept for Moses In the plains of Moab 30 days So the days of weeping and mourning For Moses were ended So now Moses has died Now look what it says in verse 9 And Joshua the son of Manan Was full of the spirit of wisdom For Moses had laid his hands upon him And this is the key part And the children of Israel Hearkened unto him and did as Yahweh commanded Moses. Now verse 10, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like Moses. So here we go. Moses just died, and now Joshua took over leadership after Moses, and then the scripture said there arose a prophet not, not like Moses in Israel. Well, there couldn't be who he was talking about in Deuteronomy 18 when he clearly said he's going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses, and then as soon as Moses died, Joshua took over, and the Most High said there didn't raise a prophet like Moses in Israel since in that time. That clearly shows that that prophet was not Joshua, but it was Yahweh Shah, the Messiah of the New Testament. That's my comment. I appreciate your comment, brother. Let's go to the next person with a comment. Uh, Skype caller. Skype caller. Somebody calling from Skype. You'll have on the debate talk for you. Any questions? Any comments? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, real quick comment. See, any time that man has said that God has sectioned out a group of people and letting that group of people that live in a quote-unquote geographical era on this earth and saying God signifies them as the special people, that's the problem of the world because that's causing division. That will always cause division. When you say another group of people are higher than any other group of people, it's going to cause war. It's going to cause chaos. No one is higher in this world. All of the cultures, everything, make up all of the cultures needed each other to make us who we are now. So I've been listening to you all for a matter of hours, and I say, hey, this is the exact problem why we have this war and this chaos in this world. You guys have a nice day. I appreciate your call, brother. appreciate your call. Uh, 312-312-532. You're live on the Bay Talk for you. You have a quick comment? Shalom, shalom. This is Brother Moshe Ben Israel from Chicago. Uh, this is my comment. I think it is rather arrogant for the beloved rabbi to use the term 
our people, my people, we did this and we did that. I think the beloved guest is letting him off the hook with that. That is offensive. And he's very arrogant. And he meant exactly what he said. But I'm going to have him to read the book of Psalms 147, 19 and 20. I myself know I fit the bill in Deuteronomy 28. And when the Almighty Yah speaks and gave the law in Torah, he gave it to a particular people to teach the rest of the sons and daughters of Adam. And that wasn't the people that he's claiming that he says he is. But it is rather arrogant for him to say that and then smirk. And we, as brothers and sisters on this line, let him off the hook with that. But if you go into some of their circles and do that, you will get crucified. I challenge anyone on this line to go into a synagogue Friday evening and use the term my people to any rabbi in any synagogue. Now watch how quick they remove you from the facility. Just try it. But again, my last comment is that is arrogant. Please, beloved rabbi, don't do that when you are amongst the children of the Most High Yah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Shalom. I appreciate your call, brother. One more quick comment. One more quick comment before we go into the final statement. 832-607. Your live on debate talk for you. Any questions? Any comments? Quick comments. Um, I, have a, I have a quick comment. Beautiful, beautiful scripture by the last brother that's, that came on. And um, I just, you know, the last caller, you know, said that, you know, this was, you know, spreading division or whatever. But, you know, we got to really tap into the aspect of a creator. You know, everybody has their favorite food. Everybody has their favorite color. Everybody has their favorite aspect of anything. And if we are um, creators, reflections of the creator, he has his favorites. And according to the Bible, the favorites of the people are the people that fit the bill. And, you know, I, you know, I didn't listen to the whole debate, but I came into a section and, you know, I, I heard, you know, that, that we people are people. And, you know, that too was very offensive to me. So I'm sure... You know, everybody that, that, that knows the people that fit the bill, I'm sure everybody was was very disrespected when the brother said that. But, you know, that's all my comment. And I just, you know, my comment changed just because the brother brought out the vision. So, you know, I won't say any more. But, you know, thanks, Sal. You know, it was a great show. I yeah, appreciate the call, brother. appreciate the call. All right, so now we're going to go into the final statement. Once again, I appreciate everybody. I try to get to as much people as possible, but, you know, time doesn't permit, so we've got to go into the final statement right now. Once again, I appreciate everybody that had a question and their comments. So uh, we're going to go into the final statements. Of course, we're going to start off with Rabbi Asher Meza. The comment, well, the final statement is going to be seven minutes each, so let's do it right now. Let's go to Rabbi Asher Meza. you got seven minutes, and go ahead. I hope everyone here could stop thinking always in terms of race. If there are any Muslims in the audience, I'd like to ask them, what does Ummah mean? Of course, Ummah means nation. could also mean people. But a nation built off belief. Every time I say my people, I mean people who think like I do, people who keep Torah, people who haven't sold out and added or taken away from the undisputed commands from the Almighty. That's what people mean to me, especially when I say my people. I'm not sure why every time a person hears that, they get into defensive. They're thinking I'm talking about some sort of white Jew when I'm not even technically white. Anyways, friends, tonight you've heard both sides of the issue, the Torah side and the Christian New Testament side. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to remind you, that you can't have it both ways. Either the Torah is right and the New Testament is wrong, or the New Testament is right and the Torah is wrong. It's either compassion through standards, Torah lays it down, or your decency is determined by some human sacrifice on a cross. If you think you can have it both ways, rather, if you think you can have it both ways, you will end up having neither. As it states in Mishle in Proverbs, that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but ultimately it leads him to destruction. And friends, let the words of the Almighty be true, and every man a liar. So know that I'm here tonight as a messenger of the King of Kings telling you, come home. It's nothing to do with race. My people are people who keep Torah. No matter what race they happen to be, 
it sounds like a lot of people out there disagree with me tonight. Maybe some Jew misguided you into believing that blood matters and that you would never amount to anything and that Israel, oh no, we're a race. Not true. You may have heard that Judaism teaches that you are inferior and intrinsically impure just because of the blood running through your veins. True. You are not inferior. You are created and loved by your Father in heaven. And he wants you back. He wants you to have no intermediaries between you and him. That's what you've made your Messiah, a middleman. And my friends, he wants you to come home. You've been force-fed nonsense every Sunday from your pulpits. They build a house with no foundation for you. But friends, tonight, let me fill you in on humanity's true love story. That God so loved the world, not that he gave us some son, but rather he gave us a higher standard to aspire to. So what? So that man no longer had to live like an animal. This is the eternal message found in Torah. And that's it, my friends. So come home. To learn more about Torah Judaism, please visit my website, bejewish.org. Just type in my name, Asher Meza, on YouTube. I have hundreds of videos explaining what the Torah is trying to teach us. According to the literal text, if God is a good God, that Torah to be as easily understood by the average seven-year-old than the average theologian. It's one message. He's not playing any games here. He's not separating by race. It was always about commitment. It was always about sacrifice on our end. And I want to thank Brother Sal and Brother Sadok Ben Yisrael. And God willing, one day we could do this again. God bless. And once again, I want to thank you as well, Rabbi Asher Meza, for being the first rabbi to have a grace uh, the debate talk for you stage. So I'm definitely going to have you back in the future. I appreciate you being on the show. So once again, we're going into the final statement of this debate. We're going to go to Zadok Ben Israel. He has seven minutes. Let me just put him in now. And go ahead, Zadok. Well, I think tonight was a good night. I think that these two sides of the spectrum needed to be brought to the table. And I'm glad that the Most High saw fit for me to be uh, one of the individuals tonight to come to the table. Brothers and sisters, uh, I think that Brother Nezer is very passionate, and I will not question his dedication to serving the Most High. But I will question his understanding of what he continuously quotes as esoteric understanding of prophecy. I believe that that is something that is said for those who may not understand prophecy. Now, I don't claim to understand all prophecy, but these things aren't written because they're hidden. There is nothing written in the prophets that's necessarily hidden. The understanding of it can be hidden. The understanding of it can be secret to some, but the Lord reveals his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. That is also written in the Torah. Let me point out the holes and remind the people of the things that Brother Neza uh, was, was not able to explain tonight. Brother Neza was not able to explain satisfactorily, at least in my opinion, what Genesis 49 meant by the law shall not depart nor the scepter from Judah until Shiloh come and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And he shall ride upon his donkey, and he shall uh, have with it uh, the foal of the donkey. Then I went to Zechariah 9 and 9, and I pointed out and asked him, Who is this? Who is this king that come unto the people, lowly and meek, having salvation, riding upon an ass with the colt, the foal of an ass? And he said those two things had nothing to do with one another in his opinion. And he believed, see, you're taking those esoteric things and you're making a doctrine. I'm not making a doctrine. We're reading that these things belong to a king, not a whole bunch of kings. I'm going to put one scripture on the table tonight that I didn't bring out, but I will bring it out just for the sake of edification. So once again, these kind of things can be understood and pondered upon and 
may the Most High give understanding. Um, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yah, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of Yah, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. This one first with his saying, with his preaching of justice and judgment, and his reproof for equity in the earth. He has slayed the wicked with his mouth, not meaning he killed him just by saying die, but his doctrine shall put to rest all of the fallacy and all of the maliciousness of man. That is what Yeshua has done. Isaiah 53 and verse 10, brothers and sisters, the one who shall make his soul an offering for sin. The brother said that there is no idea of vicarious sacrifice in the scripture, but yet every animal ever sacrificed as a sin offering was a vicarious or substitute for the man or the people who were sinning. So the idea of a substitute for Every man dying is definitely in the scriptures, brothers and sisters. And the last thing that I'm going to put on the table tonight is this. When we speak of the New Testament, we do not speak of it as being a replacement for the Old Testament. But just as many called in tonight speaking of Deuteronomy chapter 28, when you read the book of Judges, why why is that there? Because it is confirming, it is a witness to things that the Torah prophesied would happen, and Yahweh had written the things that happened. He looks at the New Testament as some kind of replacement of the old, but no, it is a witness and a testimony that certain Shiloh has been revealed. The king who would come, as it is written in the scriptures, has been revealed. Brothers and sisters, coming on his fold with an ass, with her, I'm sorry, on an ass with her coat with her. The one out of Jesse who would come and preach a doctrine of equity and would prove the earth with just judgment has been revealed. In the book of Micah, it tells us that out of Bethlehem would come the one who shall be ruler in Israel and whose going forth had been from old and from everlasting. This is what makes the New Testament relevant to salvation, not that it replaces Torah, but that the Torah, just like the book of Judges, just like we read Jeremiah and Isaiah, and they confirm the the destruction and captivity coming to the nation, the New Testament confirms that Shiloh has been revealed, that king, that Messiah. And as Brother Nezah said, among the orthodoxy, they have a saying, if you got rabbis saying eight different things, then they let it go. We say in one thing, and they refuse to believe it, and they'll rather continue to argue over those eight points among them. Brothers and sisters, the New Testament is relevant in the revealing of the Holy One of Israel. And as it said in Deuteronomy 18, whoever ignore his word, Yahweh will require it. I hope Brother Nezah listens, and I pray we do get to do this again on another topic. Thank you, Sal, and thank you, audience. Shalom. And once again, I want to thank you as well as the Doc Ben Israel for bringing forth your knowledge to the masses out here. Just for the record, just to let everybody know, we have, listening right now on Debate Talk for you, 89,700 listeners live listening to the show. I really appreciate everyone out here that tuned in to Debate Talk for you. I appreciate your support, guys. What I'm going to do right now, I'm going to have uh, Rabbi Asher and uh, so Doc Ben Israel give some information like uh, the website information and stuff like that, so people can get in contact with the brothers. Uh, Rabbi Asher, uh, share your information out there, emails, whatever you want to put out there for people to reach you. My main website is called bejewish.org, and from there you could reach my other organizations that um, really break down our theological stance amongst the Orthodox community. I'm based out of North Miami Beach, Florida, and if anyone wants to swim by, come learn with me, come to the synagogue with me, they're welcome to do so. We are a completely open organization. We, we don't discriminate. I mean, I can't say that about all Jews. I mean, I can't say that about all Christians. 
but we live Torah, and we try to emulate our Father in Heaven. So, again, my website is bejewish.org, and you can just go to YouTube and type in my name, and you'll get a bunch of videos teaching Torah. God bless. Right, thanks a lot, brother. All right, uh, it's Dr. Israel. Any information you want to put out there for the masses that want to reach you? Uh, yes, we have a show every... Uh, Tuesday night called the Growing Stone Bible Study Forum. It is on here on the Block Talk channel, uh, blogtalkradio.com slash Nazarene. Every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, and every Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we also ha- have a website, www.congregationisrael.net. If you'd like to email me personally, uh, or, or if you'd like to Facebook friend me, you can find me under my name, Z-A-D-O-K, Ben Israel, all one word, Z-A-D-O-K, Ben Israel, at Facebook.com. Also, you can type in that name on YouTube. We have many teachings, and you can find out uh, uh, more of the things that the Creator has revealed on all types of different topics dealing with Torah and dealing with the New Testament. You can also go to another channel we have on YouTube, Knesset Yeshua. K-N-E-S-S-E-T-Y-S-H-U-A. And if you'd like to reach out to us personally even more, you could call us at 1-866-78-BIBLE. That's 1-866-78-BIBLE. And, Brother Mega, I do be down south a lot during the winter, so I just might take you up on that offer to come see you, my brother, because I have no issue against you. Actually, I personally uh, I think that you uh, are very sincere. And I have no issue with you. So uh, I, I know how to find you, brother. Thank you all. No, I appreciate you, my brother. And once again, once again, thanks to the listening audience out there for tuning in on a Thursday night, making this show, you know, again, one of the highest shows as far as listeners live on Debate Talk for you. Tune in tomorrow, guys. Uh, Triple Debate, we, 